The Emperor of Man, Part 2, Heresy and the Imperium. It is by Luton 9 and you should be able to find the link in the description down below if you want to watch this um, sort of without interruption. I interrupt a lot. I speak a lot. I pause a lot. So this is definitely not the best way for you to watch this if you have not watched this before. Yeah. So, you know, strap the fuck in and uh, let's get going. And the grim dog. Dude, I love that fucking quote so much. Wait. They are my bulwark against the terror. They are my defenders of humanity. They are my space marines. And they shall know no fear. The emperor of mankind. Oh, yeah. This is about the heresy in the Imperium, so it's gonna get good. Humanity is entering the 31st millennium. The Emperor's crusade to reunite humanity is a resounding success. Ah, oh, the Chad did it, bro. Giga Chad Emperor, bro. He did it. The Astartes Brotherhood stands stronger than ever. Humanity stands at a crossroads. Total victory and reunification of the human race is a near certainty. Nothing can stop us. Oh! Yeah, they were so close to winning? The 31st millennium of man would be one of the darkest and most destructive humanity had faced. It would bring the newly established Imperium to its knees and deal wounds so severe it would never truly recover. I need to say that this section of Imperial law is vastly complex and heavily documented. Bearing that in mind, I'll be covering it in a briefer fashion as specific events can be looked at later in it is time. Better to However, be feared than the 31st loved. millennium is one of the most important periods as it deals with the fall of humanity as a truly dominant power and the inception of the Imperium that would exist into the 41st millennium. Here we go. The Horus Heresy. This was essentially a mutiny by several Primarchs and their Space Marine legions, a betrayal against the Emperor and the Imperium instigated by the War Master Horus Lupercal. Now considering how much is written about these events, it actually takes place over a very short time scale in the general scheme of events in 40k, lasting for only about seven years. As I already outlined, wow. this rebellion ultimately was orchestrated by, at this time, the unknown forces of chaos. Yet there were many secondary factors, and arguably, even without the influence of chaos, it seems possible that these events could have taken place without dark suggestions from the warp, albeit likely to a lesser extent. The Emperor's How would it return have happened, to Terra though? to establish new projects that, for whatever reason, he was unwilling to also share with even Horus or any of the Primarchs, left them feeling set aside and cast out from his circle of trust. This would lead to feelings of resent or in some outright anger and disgust. This was less though about ego or pride than it was trust, although there was no doubt these emotions were an element in play. 
Primarchs, despite their demigod-like stature and ability, were fundamentally human at the core. It was more about their deep connection to the Emperor, and perhaps that they saw themselves not as equal, but at least on a similar level to him. His retreat to Earth and abandonment of them at this juncture certainly left them feeling consigned to the rest of humanity. Wow, so the Emperor could have saved himself so much trouble if he just didn't go back. Fuck. Looking back at it, hindsight being 2020 is a bitch, bro. These feelings were surely only fragments of doubt, not an outright stab to the heart, but nonetheless, the seeds of mistrust were sown, and those chinks in the armor of the Imperium were exactly what the Dark War entities of Chaos looked for. Another factor in the resentment and frustration felt by the Primarchs and some higher officers in Space Moon Legions would be the Council of Terror. This was a governing body charged with the administration and infrastructure control of the Crusade and Imperium as a whole. It was controversial among the Astartes as it comprised an all-human council. Primarchs and Space Moons alike were not given permission to sit with the Terra Council. Their role was for that of war and all- Wait, I don't understand. They're human too. What do they mean that the, the Council of Terror was human only? The Astartes are human, they're just enhanced. So, when they say all human, they mean it was non-enhanced human beings. But though that picture, they're very fucking modified there, right? Oh, how you doing, bro? Baseline human. Okay, so they only allowed for normal, unaffected, unsort of fucked, unfucked humans were the only ones allowed. All military matters were handled by the War Master. One of the most primary council members was the previously mentioned Malkador the Sigilite. Malkador was no simple man though. He was a psyker of immense power and used these abilities to reach out into the vast realms of space. He was a close aide to the Emperor during Earth's Unification Wars and is said to have formed the Administratum of Terror. So he is no mere administrator, but a vastly important figure, as important, in fact, as any Primarch. Some of the Emperor's sons, though, did not feel that the Imperium should be run by human bureaucrats, and so the Council of Terror- Malkador is still alive, no? Isn't Malkador- No, Who, who's the guy that is the, um... No, that's not Malkador. So Malkador is dead. Dari Malkor, may I have your approval for marrying my waifu, Sister of Silence? He's dead. Malkador the Euro is not alive in 40k. Ah, uh, okay, so he has died. Fuck. Terror would become another- No, 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 the guy I'm thinking of is the one that's in charge of the- What are they called again? The people from Mars? The tech priests. So, uh, the Adeptus Mechanicus. The, the one that sort of doesn't actually believe in the omni -Sire, but does believe in the omni -Sire. Uh Is it Call? Valerius Call. Okay. Yes. All right. All right. So two different people. Malkador used to be the sort of like one of the higher ups in the Imperium. Call now is sort of the, the, the machine dude. Like the guy that comes up with all of the machine shit. Another chip on the shoulder and a contributing factor to heresy. One last and specific act though would turn at least one Primarch away from the Emperor and continue to raise doubts in others. The disciplining of Lorgar. Lorgar was the Primarch of the Word Bearers, or as they often referred to themselves, the Bearers of the Word. The word referred to is the Emperor's Word. However, the Word Bearers were almost fundamentalist in their beliefs. Lorgar believed with every fiber of him that the Emperor himself was a divine being. Oh, one shit. true god of mankind. They believed this to the core. Wow, so these guys actually started this bullshit. Like, they started the religion, even before the religion was an actual religion. And preached it across their homeworld, as well as any they encountered during the Expeditionary Crusades. 
but the emperor had long since outlawed any concept of belief and religion, imposing a strictly secular rule of law in the imperial truth to create a constructively rationalist society. For the longest time though, these religious emanations were suspected and tolerated by the imperial council, and even to an extent by the emperor. Eventually, however, the word bearers came under closer scrutiny by the simple fact that by comparison to other legions, they were unbearably slow with their conquest rate during the crusade. An investigation fleet was sent by the Imperial Council to establish what was causing this slow progress. On arrival at some of the conquered worlds of the word bearers, they found their answer. To the fleet commander's horror, they had discovered that the word bearers had been spending years indoctrinating and converting the worlds to the illegal and false faith of the Imperium. This was a tediously slow process and took significantly longer than usual conquests, as was often so bloody due to the worlds initially resisting having an enforced faith. This egregious practice was considered an abject failure of duty by the Imperium and the Emperor himself. Worse still, it came to light that the word bearers had been employing a standard practice to execute those who did not renounce their faith and accept that of the Imperium. Oh, dude, no wonder the Emperor got fucking angry. Because literally one of his sons have turned him into a god. What's interesting is how humanity did not learn from this, nor do they seem to care. Although I'm assuming this is lore that normal humanity have no idea about any of this. An emperor as the divine faith, which only served to pour more fuel onto the flames of outrage. The emperor was absolutely enraged by this notion that he should be worshipped as a god and the actions of the word bearers in his name slaughtering those who refused to accept the emperor's divinity stank of the religious excesses that had so often poisoned human history and the emperor had witnessed firsthand throughout the ages. So the word bearers had not only broken his principal rules but also wasted vast amounts of time and resources. Mm -hmm. All the worlds they had brought into the Imperium had to be purged in an extremely traumatic process, wasting more lives and more resources. W wait, what? To balance these incomprehensible actions, the Emperor would publicly humiliate Lorgar. To publicly reprimand a Primarch in front of his space marines and even present humans was an unprecedented act, and it cut Lorgar to the core. In one encounter, his faith was publicly ripped from him by the Emperor, and all the worlds they had conquered were to be purged. Lorgar was Jesus. beside himself, as were all the word bearers, to not only have their faith burned away, but to also know that all their years of efforts counted for naught was an unbearable burden to carry. Seems like an overreaction, to be honest. The Emperor did not want to break and ruin the word bearers or Lorgar. He was not vindictive in that way. He wanted to merely set them back on the path to being an effective force for the Imperium and mankind. To cure this corruption, the Emperor turned to the glorious Ultramarines and Robert Gilliman, known for his exceptional tact and unflinching loyalty to the Emperor. The Ultramarines were the word bearers mirror and shadow alike in so many ways and different in so many others. A living example of what the word bearers had the potential to be. The Emperor ordered a task force comprised of Ultramarines, his elite personal bodyguards, and the Imperial Council. Wait, Ultramarines? Is that just a separate faction, or are they even better than the Marines? This didn't happen overnight. Before going full in, he gave them many chances and warnings. Remember, before he went out to conquer the stars, the Emperor purged Terra of every religion. So it is ironic shit show that he now is being heralded as a god. True. It's just a name. Okay, okay. So the Ultramarines, literally just another name. Okay. because For a second there, I was like, wait. I know most of the power levels, and I don't remember ever hearing about Ultramarines. I, I, I've, I've sort of heard of all of the different power levels within the Imperium. Ultramarines is not one of the things I've heard about before. Blue boys with Omega sign on the shoulder? Ah. All right. For Regent Malkador the Sigilite, their mission, to raise the capital city of the planet Kerr to the ground. 
a planet of high importance to the word bearers who considered its capital Monarchia the perfect city because of the citizens intense religious devotion and the sheer number of cathedrals and monuments dedicated hey, to the harsh. worship of the emperor as the god of humanity. Following a temporary mass evacuation of bewildered human citizens who could not understand what crime they had committed sent out distress signals to Ultramar. the world bearers, who okay. they considered to be angels. Rogue soldier, thanks for the first attack, really appreciate that and also thank you for clearing it up. They are sucked off by Games Workshop. I don't know. Do you think it's necessary? I don't think it's necessary. Like, if the god that you're worshipping as a god would just show up and be like, hey, by the way, I'm not a god. You don't have to worship me. I feel like that would be enough. Like that, that should be enough. Purging the entire fucking world seems to me like an overreaction. I, I think that's the equivalent of seeing a spider in your house and then burning the fucking neighborhood down. A little bit enough. Like, a little bit too much, I think. The Ultramarines, though, continued their mission and engaged in the orbital destruction of Monarchia. The Wordbearers Legion arrived to answer the distress calls of the planet, only to find to their utter confusion the Ultramarines in orbit. The Wordbearers were ordered to assemble planet side. 100,000 Marines were ordered within sight of the smoldering, raised ruins of Monarchia, where the Emperor uh. himself stood. The word bearers were forced, along with all others in attendance, including Lorgar, to kneel before him in the ashes of the city, which stood for all they had believed and done in the name of the Emperor and the Imperium. He explained to them in no uncertain terms that they had failed in duty, that their efforts had been futile and wasted beliefs were an abhorrence. He was no god, no angel, no divine being, but a man. No such belief would be permitted in his Imperium. Yeah, bro. The Emperor departed, leaving yeah. a Primarch humiliated and a Legion humbled. Lorgar was physically and psychologically numbed by the Emperor's actions. The raising of the city of Monarchia was a trauma almost too great for many of the word bearers to cope with, and had it not been for their strength of genetics, they would have likely been mass suicides and insanity. Lorgar himself, though, fell into a deep melancholy that would burn harder and brighter within him as days turned to weeks turned to months. Why is this sequence of events so important? Yeah. In the future years of the Imperium, it was said that all that would later come to pass was born in this microcosm. That the mission and humiliation carried out here would be recalled as the catalyst of a galactic civil war. The ruination of the word bearers is critical in understanding the next sequence of events. I can they understand. From the events. You see, the, the problem there is, I can understand both sides. So I understand what the emperor is trying to do. The emperor doesn't want religion because religion brings chaos. Religion can cause so many issues. We know this, okay? But at the same time, it's kind of like this... So, if you permit me to use a real-life example that we spoke about just the other day. We currently in Europe have uh, a war going on, right? Ukraine, Russia, massive fucking war. Everyone knows about it. It's sort of the same thing. You're in a catch-22 where there really is no good fucking answer to the problem. Because if Russia wins... The Ukrainian people now become Russian, and that's not a good place to be because they don't necessarily want to be Russian. But if Russia loses, they have nukes. And uh, if Russia did lose, there is a chance that they go, well, fuck it, right? And then just nuke everyone. So that's also a bad place to be. So it's sort of like, if they win, we fucked. If they lose, we might be fucked, right? So that's where I see the em emperor sort of being here. It's kind of like... A, what decision do I make? And I feel the way in which he went about it, there was almost always going to be trouble because he effectively, I don't know how the chaos works exactly, but if you have someone of that level of power falling into a deep melancholy, considering what I know about the, uh, the Aldar, that melancholy is almost certainly reaching the warp. The Chaos Gods at this point will almost certainly be aware of uh, whatever his name is, the Logan. They're almost certainly aware of him at this point. 
impact on Kerr, as well as the ritual humiliation and destruction of the Legion's faith. The fate of the word bearers at this time is sketchy due to the destructive nature of this period and the events to follow, but it is known that they disappeared for a time, seemingly lost in a whirlwind of confusion, disillusionment, and even rage. Not Logan, whatever the fucking guy's name is. I don't know what his name is, uh, but who's the guy? Uh, the head of the word bearers. Lorgar, thank you. Yes, okay, so Lorgar. Um, the leader of the of the the word bearers. I mean, the emperor created this problem. I'm not gonna lie to you, the emperor fucking created this problem. I feel like there may have been better ways of dealing with this that maybe wouldn't have pushed him into the arms of the chaos gods. Effectively, the emperor's hope that they would be set straight on the path of the imperial truth was flawed, and their resentment hugely underestimated. Instead, they withdrew, wandering the galaxy, seeking, waiting for a light of clarity to guide them. It seems likely that Lorgar's fall began after Monarchia, that the dark powers of the warp reached out to him in his despair and offered him that which the Emperor had denied him, a divine power to believe in. Oh, it is not known shit. whom these voices that counseled him were, it's possible, but entirely speculative, that as with Horus later, some of his closest officers, such as Erebus, the word bearer's first chaplain, would be the first to be corrupted and then begin the spread of darkness. Of what is certain, though, is that when the word bearers reappeared to rejoin the Great Imperial Crusade, they appeared to be refocused as the Emperor had hoped. But this was far from the truth. The word bearers now no longer serve the Emperor or humanity, oh, and were the very sure. first Space Marine Legion to fall to the darkness of chaos. The war between humanity yeah, and chaos yeah, we had go. still not come until more of the Emperor's crusading forces had been seeded with dark betrayal. Horus Lupercal, favour of the Emperor, war master of the Crusade, would become the apex of these events. The real treachery would begin on a small planet named Davin. This world had been okay. easily absorbed into the Imperium by Horus and his legion, the Lunar Wolves, some 60 years previously. The warrior people living there quickly realised they were outclassed and bowed to the powers of the Imperium. Good. Horus was impressed with their realism, honour and strength. Okay. Spending time there, the Lunar Wolves brought away from Davin the concept of the Warrior Lodge, a close clique of senior brothers who would share their knowledge and opinions evenly without rank obstruction. It feels like it feels like friendship is a huge problem in this fucking realm. Like you should actually not be friends with anyone because being friends with someone or like close allies with someone can almost definitely fuck you because if they fall to chaos, you're next. Like you're so fucking close to falling then. The concept of lodges, guilds, or clans within a legion or imperial force was strictly outlawed by the emperor as something which could brew dangerous opinions and dissent, as evidently turned out to be the case. Horus decided that he knew better. Now, Erebus, the aforementioned first chaplain of the word bearers, was at this point fully corrupted by chaos. He reported Shit. to the Lunar Wolves that Commander Temba, the governor of Davin, and his forces had turned renegade and dug themselves into a fortress on Davin's moon. Horus led an assault force to clear the moon and extract Temba personally. On the surface, his forces were confronted by the foul, reanimated remains of Temba's outpost, who had evidently succumbed to the chaos plague of Nurgle's rot skewing Wait, them into what? horrific parodies of the human form. Horus slew the grossly altered Temba personally, but not before Temba managed to strike a blow to Horus using the advanced blade, the Anatheme. The Anatheme, you will recall, was the highly advanced blade stolen decades previous by Erebus from the people known as the Interrex. The weapons appeared to be semi-sentient, as the Interrex claimed the weapons could be instructed to recognise a particular person, which gave them the ability to mortally wound that person. The Interrex did not know how to produce these weapons, but had confiscated them from a Xenos race known as the Kinebrak. 
Killer it seems clear that Erebus orchestrated the whole sequence of events on Davin's moon, and potentially worse, had already been corrupted by Chaos even prior to his theft of the Anatheme from the Interrex years before. The distorted chaos riddled Timber had been instructed to speak. D Rocker, you can swear, just Twitch being a little fucking slut. Um, so these swords are effectively the same as sort of the. Uh, uh, we have a couple of these blades. We call them Morn Blades in World of Warcraft. Blades that have the ability to think, the ability to act almost as if. Almost as if sentient. These swords can kill anything. But then, isn't that the same as the Emperor's weapon? Because the Emperor's weapon can apparently also kill a soul, which is what the Emperor did to Horus, right? To work now, we'll have to watch the rest of your reaction in Eclipse Channel. Argyth, thank you so much for hanging out. We really appreciate that. Ah, so the Emperor has one of these little bad boys as well. Blades that were folded one too many times. Damn those weaves. Now, Emperor's weapon kills demons. Wouldn't these weapons be able to kill demons too? Big E sword is on another level. Different. They can't kill... Ah, oh, so they can't kill souls. They can just mortally wound a person, but they can't take down the soul. Okay. Horus Lubakal's name to the blade. This meant that upon striking the greatest Primarch of the Imperium, it would wound him in such a way as to be beyond even his demigod-like powers of healing. The fate of the Anatheme would still have importance in the years to come. Horus was taken back to his ship, the Vengeful Spirit, where Apothecaries frustratingly determined his wound could not be healed naturally or otherwise. Horus's Mournival, his lodge of closest officers, took him in their despair to the Serpent Lodge on Davin, where Erebus assured them he knew how to heal the Warmaster in a special This Erebus fuck him, bro. This was, of course, all part of Erebus's plan. During this ritual, Horus's spirit would be transferred into the warp along with Erebus, disguised as one of the Warmaster's closest friends, Hester Sajanus, captain of the Fourth Company. This out-of-body experience showed Horus a terrifying vision of the future, which unbeknownst to him were caused by his very actions. Bringing the Imperium into an age of repressive, violent and superstitious regime where the Emperor and some of the most loyal Primarchs were worshipped as divine beings by the fanatical and ignorant masses of humanity. The Chaos Gods portrayed themselves as the victims of the Emperor's psychic might, who had been Shit. suppressed throughout the ages and had no interest themselves in controlling the material world. Horus, already having Jesus. grown jealous and deeply resentful of the perceived poor treatment at the hands of the Emperor, and was one of many of the Astartes legions afraid of the concept of a peace, wherein all for which they had fought would be turned over to weak-willed mortal men whilst his legions were cast aside and left as peacekeepers without a purpose. These were the Emperor's wishes. For you see, the Astartes were always a tool to save humanity and bring power back to mankind, not just to subjugate it. Horus, in his weakened and embittered state, was uh -huh. very suggestible and would accept this twisted and misunderstood prophecy. But there was one thing Erebus had not counted on. Horus's brother, Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons, a legion and chapter who had widely embraced psychers and their unique powers, had continued to study the forbidden arts of warp manipulation and sorcerous powers. The Cyclopean giant of Magnus appeared within Horus's vision, revealing Erebus' true identity and begging Horus not to fall in to the temptations of chaos. Oh, shit. It was all in vain though. Horus had by now already decided that if anyone deserved to be worshipped as a god, then it was he. The godlike warp demons of chaos healed Horus' wounds and between them made a deal. In exchange for the immense power he would gain, as well as ruling power over the mortal galaxy, he would deliver to them the Emperor. Bro, what the fuck? Holy.
That's genius. It, it is fucking genius. As much as I hate this happening, it is so clever. It's the ultimate bait and switch. Who the dark chaos gods feared most as they knew he alone stood with enough power to potentially destroy them. Although Horus had always been an immensely skillful military leader, his true genius was in the manipulation of others. This was often remarked upon by his brother Primox. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first chat, really appreciate that. In this one so far, Magnus really didn't do anything wrong. I mean, Magnus appeared inside the warp to Horus, but played with Horus not to actually go along with this. So I can I I don't believe that Magnus did anything wrong so far at least. Did nothing wrong as far as they knew they were following the orders of the Emperor. That's why I hate the rate gun of the uh, scathering as it downplays chaos. Magnus didn't do anything wrong. Wait for it. Just wait. Okay. Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists once noting to Garviel Loken, who you remember was the Lunar Wolves captain and a member of the Mournival that Horus had Loken put forward a campaign of war so his character would be more well known as a peacemaker than a warmonger. Dawn said, You understand what Horus had you do this morning. He had primed the Mournival to back him, Loken. He is cultivating the air of a peacemaker, for that plays well across the world to the Imperium. This morning he wanted someone other than himself to suggest unleashing the legions for war. This skill of manipulation would be especially important now. It was one thing for the Chaos Aberrations to turn a few men and even a Primarch, but to turn legions and still more Primarchs, the strongest willed and most loyal of the Emperor's forces to Chaos? How would this be possible? Uh, Disco Mushrooms, thanks so much for the follow, really appreciate it, welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Magnus Manning of goodness, he just didn't have access to all the information. But they weren't following the Emperor's orders, they hear the Emperor's name in the command and they bark and attack anything. Possible. Well, it would in part because Horus did not declare himself outright as a disciple of Chaos, nor would he follow immediately the darkest of their practices. As had been the case until now, the game being played was one of subtlety and deception. Horus began implementing throughout the legions the concept of the Mournival, that that he had allowed first within the Lunar Wolves. The Mournival Lodge enabled officers to group together in secret and lay the seeds of discontent and mutiny. Horus would also capitalize on the current negative feelings among some of his fellow Primarchs and then the refracted disillusionment among some of the legions. Lorgar and the word bearers had already turned to chaos following their world shattering humiliation by the Emperor. Horus would engage legions of Astartes, Imperial troops, and even several Mars Titans. Dude, it must be like this is supposed to be the soldiers that protect you. These are the frontline troops. They are the ones, they are the bulwark against the universe. And in silence, they are now being turned into humanity's greatest enemy. Titan legions with the principal concept that Horus now perceived the Emperor, powerful as he was, did not deserve the unreserved praise and recognition of the human race. More Astartes legions would now join the traitors, Angron and the World Eaters, Mortarion and his Death Guard, Fulgrim and the Emperor's children were among the first to side with the War Master. Others would later fall, including the Iron Warriors, Night Lords, Alpha Legion, and lastly, the Thousand Sons. How did the Thousand Sons It had become clear that the Primarchs were far from the perfect demigod-like human form they were perceived to be. Although technically each Primarch was physically and mentally godlike compared to a standard human, they still bore all of humanity's virtues as well as their flaws. Lysaria, thanks for the deal and sub, really appreciate that. Seven months in a row. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind. Um, I'm very good, Lysaria. Thank you so much for asking. How are you? Yeah, Horus gave all Chaos Legions the new cool shit like good armor and leave all the shit to... Wait, lossless. Thousand Sons are Magnus's Legion, so you'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's Magnus's Legion. 
people such as ego, greed, envy, arrogance, rage, and more besides. These superhuman warriors were meant to be the saviors of mankind, but instead- It's interesting that he removed fear, right? He removed fear, but not the other emotions, which would have saved them a lot if he had removed the other emotions. Said they could be the downfall of everything that had been salvaged and achieved. The Thousand Sons Legion would be a particularly tragic story. Okay. Their Primarch Magnus the Red, who you remember had- Why would they- Why- but why, though? Krikas, thanks for the first time chat, really appreciate that. Why would they feel fear? The Space Marines are genetically modified not to feel fear. So, why would the Primarch feel fear if the Space Marines do not? Or are not all Space Marines engineered to not feel fear? Is it only some Space Marines that do not feel fear? Eodito, thanks for the follow. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Fear is not removed. It is suppressed, mastered. They can feel fear, uh, uh, but it has no effect on them. Ah. So that's more of a sort of psychological trick rather than a sort of genetically modified trick. They've just been taught to harness their fear rather than succumb to it. They don't actually know no fear. It's kind of a cool thing to say. Have emotions reduced? Not like they are emotionless. The chemical reaction is stopped with their implants. Ayodito, thanks for the primes. I did really appreciate that. Welcome to the most generous chat on Twitch. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind, sir. Uh, it's a saying, yeah? They feel fear, but they did a Batman and learned to deal with it. All right had attempted to prevent Horus from falling to darkness whilst experiencing his out-of-body experience to the warp on Davin. Magnus and the Thousand Suns Legion had begun to use psychic powers and warp sorcery as part of their Legion's general practices. This was actually outlawed by the Emperor, who was cautious of using psychic power in only controlled services. It's surprising they chose this path to break with Imperial law. However, it seems that they actually bore a natural affinity for such practices and, as with many things, likely started out small before becoming more widespread. Yeah. In time, many Space Marine Legions and chapters would use sanctioned psychers in the new Librarian branch of the forces, but in these early days, there was no regulation or established command. Oh, there's actually... As a in Dawn of War 1, the... I believe that one guy, the the sort of, like, he's a librarian, right? You do meet one of them, because I'm pretty sure they call him a librarian, but he's almost like a librarian slash priest god thing. Like, he also upholds the faith uh, over there. The Creation of Space Marines videos explains in detail how they break the minds of recruits and remade it to become much stronger. Consequence, many of the Thousand Suns Marines would suffer whole body deterioration as they would eventually become consumed by the warp powers unable to control or prevent this. Oh, fuck. It was for this reason that Magnus the Red was able to travel into the warp and see Horus in his most dire of situations. Magnus, after this incident, was so grief stricken that rather than physically travel to Earth and speak to the Emperor, which now in hindsight would have been the far better choice, he chose to use his psychic power to reach out and speak to the Emperor himself at the Imperial Palace on Terror. Oh, but shit. This would shatter all the psychic wards the Emperor had placed on the palace and severely damage the project being secretly worked on by the Emperor. This itself was connected to the psychic paths of the webway, the gateways used by the Eldar, and previously the Old Ones. This choice by Magnus was catastrophic and a rash miscalculation. His psychic assault on the Imperial Palace, his panic and frustration and anger and trauma gave free reign to the warp and its evil inhabitants to invade terror. Oh, Millions shit. of psychers died instantly as their attuned minds were burned out or demons tore them apart. Warps I see a lot of people in chat going Magnus did nothing wrong, but I'm going to agree with Bubba J here. Magnus did at least one thing wrong. Like, um, if, if we're going to start listing off all of the achievements 
and the things that Magnus have done. Maybe reaching out to the Emperor psychically was not the right way to do it. Like, that may have been, like, a miscalculation. Slight, however it may be, it is still a, ma a miscalculation because now the warp and the chaos is on terror. Storms consumed entire settlements, shockwaves flattened structures around the world, having strictly outlawed Magnus's use of sorcery and refusing to believe that Horus, his most trusted son, would betray him, the Emperor concluded wrongly for the traitor to be Magnus and the Thousand Sons. This error would be yet another travesty of judgment among the many during this whole Jesus. period. The Emperor ordered Lehman Russ and his Space Wolves to engage and destroy Magnus and the Thousand Sons. But Magnus, now defeated physically and mentally, cast out by his father, they were turned away from the Imperium and into traps to entice them into the darkness of chaos. Man, Horus, for the Emperor to be this really smart guy, he does a bunch of really stupid shit. Not gonna lie. He, he's made, so far, a number of miscalculations and missteps that have caused a lot of this. ...was all too aware that there were some Primarchs and Legions too loyalist to ever be persuaded away from the Imperium, such as the Imperial Fists, Ultramarines, Blood and Dark Angels. Horus would instead send these legions far away to the far reaches of the Empire on missions designed to keep them busy while the traitors would descend on Earth to destroy the Imperium and most critically the Emperor himself. As we outlined earlier, there would now take place many events which would lead some further astray and for the Emperor to become more aware that something was extremely wrong in the Imperium. These can be covered in more detail later. Magnus of the Thousand Sons was, for the Emperor, as far as he was aware, a lone corruptor, distorted by his unlicensed use of the warp. This, of course, was sadly the extreme opposite of the actual situation, but yeah. the extreme destruction and loss of life on Earth after it had been contained, as well as the damage to the Emperor's ongoing gateway project, would be enough to cloud his judgement. Horus, though, would now move ah. up to expand upon the early seeds of betrayal in the following campaigns of the Istvan system. Istvan. Horus would order the virus bombing of Istvan III, a planet that had declared itself separate from the Imperium. Many oh. loyalist marines from traitor legions were actually planet-side when Horus and the orbital navy performed exterminatus on the planet, killing all 12 billion inhabitants, including the space marines from multiple legions. Jesus! Horus watched from orbit, declaring, let the galaxy burn. Wow. The virus bombs laid waste to the planet, devouring any organic material they encountered, disintegrating humans and seeping into the suits and armor of any Astartes. The storms of the virus raged until the planet was nothing more than a barren desert. Oh my the god. The few remaining loyalist space marines would eventually be butchered by their brothers until Horus ordered an orbital bombardment until nothing remained alive on the surface of Isfarn 3. Enter Captain Garrow of the 7th Company Death Guard Legion. Captain Nathaniel Garrow. Garrow is one of my favourite heroes of the Horus Heresy and perhaps all of the Warhammer 40,000 universe. Okay. Namely because he was fundamentally responsible for saving the Imperium. Oh. His unwavering loyalty and strength of character, which apparently went beyond even some of the Primarchs. He is also a legendary character of the Age because of what he would become later, after the period of heresy. But again, that is another story. Garrow bore witness to the massacre on Istvan III and was quick to understand the, the real horror, not only of this specific event, but what was happening at large. Realising that he would have to escape not only the fleet of the War Master, the Sons of Horus, previously the Lunar Wolves, and the Emperor's children, but also his own legion, they would make a warp jump aboard an old fleet ship, the Eisenstein. Without having time to chart its route or destination, this left them then marooned, as well as being subject to multiple attacks from the warp by the Dark Forces of Chaos, and the specific deity Nurgle, who had corrupted and mutated his own Death Guard Legion. 
Whoa. Despite all this, they survived and proceeded to detonate their ship's core in the vain hope of attracting a ship to come and rescue them. Luckily for the crew, they succeeded and the vessel approaching turned out to be an Imperial Fist Astartes barge containing none other than the Primarch Rogal Dawn himself. Rogal Dawn? Trying to convince Dawn of Horus and the other Legion's betrayal though, was a near impossible task. The suggestion sent him into such a fit of rage, he nearly executed Garrow on the spot and would have been doomed to failure were it not for the Remembrancers. The Remembrancers were an order of historians, journalists and civilians from Earth at the time who were sent along with the expeditionary fleets of the Great Crusade. Their function was to chronicle deeds, events and generally record the history so that we could then hold that for the future Imperium of Man. Remembrances were generally it would have been It would have been helpful if all of their notes didn't get fucked as very reliable sources of information, especially those who had any psychic capabilities if they were psychers and could actually record information simply by visualizing that, by seeing it. Hey there, thanks for the first time chat, really appreciate it. Welcome to the stream. I'm very happy to have all the new viewers. Very happy to have you guys here. Garrow was the most staunch believer of the imperial truth. No religions, only silence, blah, blah, blah. After the flight of the Essen Essenstein, he became an absolute believer in the emperor's in the emperor's deity. And when okay. Rogal Dawn could actually see the events that had unfolded, he had no choice but to accept them. Returning to Terra, Dawn would speak to the emperor, and finally, the betrayal and heresy would come into the light. Garrow, though, in immense frustration, despite all his efforts, was not able to speak to the Emperor himself, but was stationed on the Lunar Colony along with the remaining Loyalist Death Guard and Imperial Navy crew of the Eisenstein. The Imperial forces on Earth considered their presence too dangerous to allow them to roam freely. Horus Lupercal had now extinguished the last shreds of loyalty from the three legions under his command, who were now complete in their misguided transition to chaos. His next target in the campaign was Istvan V. Here, he would establish a command post and reinforce his position. The Emperor, now in a fit of despair and rage at the actions of Horus, commanded seven legions of Astartes to attack and subdue the traitors, and subsequently return them to Terra to face their actions. However... Wait, so n now the Emperor believes? So the Emperor has finally gone, oh... Okay, Horus is actually, like, mega bad. Never mind. Unbeknownst to the Emperor, at least half of these legions had already been deceived and strayed from loyalty to the Imperium. They had not yet made their stance clear, but represented a dangerous deception to the Imperium. The first wave of attacks to Istvan V were carried out by the Loyalist legions, the Salamanders, the Raven Guard, and the Iron Hands. Horus had already been passed information of their landing sites and this would cost them horrific losses at this initial contact. Fuck. Worse would come though, the four remaining legions to attack were no longer loyal to the Imperium. The Night Lords, Word Bearers, Iron Warriors and Alpha Legion descended to attack in a brutal combined assault, slaughtering the remnants of the three Imperial legions. Jesus. This event would be known from here on as the Isvan 5 drop site massacre. Bro. Things look dark for the Imperium. The strongest- No wonder Chaos is such a fuck up, cause you can, you can cheat. You don't have to, or it's not obvious if you've succumbed to the Chaos. And I'm also assuming that the Chaos Gods can make you look incredibly human like you don't have to turn into a rock rotting corpse you know if nurgle wants you to look normal and not look like you're rotting nurgle could do that in the novel when angron and vulcan charge at each other on istvan 4 i had a serious boner only to be denied by an explosion imagine running towards your allies just to gun you down while ca uh uh, carrying your wounded. It's fucking terrible, dude. Like, this entire thing is fucking horrendous so far.
Strongest legions were still tasked to the fringes of the galaxy, and there seemed little to stand between Horus and his now seven strong fleet of Astartes legions. Not to mention the further forces of corrupted Imperial Navy, the victorious Dark Mechanicum, who were fighting the schism of Mars, the civil war between factions on Mars loyal to Imperium and Horus, and now successfully they had won their campaign there. The traitor legions on Horus would assault and destroy many loyal Imperial bastions as they travelled towards Terra, taking years to do so in the process. By now, the Warmaster had amassed a massive army, comprising multiple groups including Titans, Astartes and advanced war gear, corrupted Imperial forces and even cultists from worlds who could spread discord and disrupt Imperial worlds through terrorism or cult activity. The word bearers especially reveled in this, often finding that their worlds, previously they converted to the divinity of the Emperor, were more than willing, within a fairly short space of time, to worship them again as gods or angels, and were a great asset to factor into their battle tactics, and Jesus. use where appropriate these expendable, gullible souls to support their forces. That's why religion is bad! Imperium, one thing was slowing down Horus and his legions. Logistics. Despite acquiring a massive force, Horus found he was unable to move it efficiently around given the limitations of the warp vessels in his fleet, and this did buy the Loyalist side some time. There is one other unmentioned force Horus found available to him, that of the warp demons themselves. However, yep. interestingly at this time, despite many Space Moon Legions pledging themselves to Horus and to Chaos, they still viewed these creatures as dangerous warp phenomena and opposite to their principles. This shows that at the time it's believable that many of the space marines aligned to Horus were perhaps not entirely aware of what it was they were signing up for and had perceived this more as a political rebellion to impose a new order to the Imperium rather than the true- Oh that is interesting. Oh that is very interesting. So huh Actually, this would mean that many of the Space Marines and the legions that followed Horus were probably not even necessarily corrupted by the Chaos. You know, th they were just following Horus because they believed in what Horus was saying, right? They didn't, like, they had no idea what the, like, what the chaos was, or even maybe even worship the chaos. For them, it was more a case of uh, Horus came up with a theory, and they actually believe this theory. They actually agree with it. The Marines followed Horus, not chaos per se. So they could be sort of changed. They, they could switch sides again, right? Dirtback Dario, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat, by the way. And no, I've not stopped playing anything. I just... Uh, yeah, my country makes it very difficult for me to do long streams. So I'm basically trying to get as much streaming in in the short amount of time that my country allows, which then means no real gameplay, you know. Sadly, Mr. Juice, how you doing, bro? Truth of the matter, which was that they're in fact surrendering it to a true fall into a hellish reality and a foul darkness that later awaited them all. Yeah. This would also be in part down to the previous decisions to instigate a rule of ignorance over such matters, meaning many Astartes warriors genuinely had no real knowledge of what chaos was or what it represented. Although it has to be said that this was rapidly changing and faster among some legions than others. Mm -hmm. Matters overall were made worse by the sheer amount of confusion reigning at this time. The warp had been disturbed, making warp travel again difficult. As outlined, this was both a positive and a negative for both sides concerned. It also made communication yeah. difficult, meaning some worlds could not be warned and meant that many did not know the truth of the matter or oh, who dude, they it's could such trust. a maze. And what's sad is the Emperor the the Imperium had just gotten like their shit sorted. After the dark age of technology and after all the bullshit, things have finally, finally started to go their way again. And uh, here we are, back again, more war, another civil war that's about to fucking ruin everything. The, the humanity can just not catch a break, man. 
Rogel Dawn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists, had been stationed on Terra for some years now after his return with Nathaniel Garrow, and barely rested in his activities to prepare an insurmountable defence of Terra. However, his task was made all the more difficult by the warp storms which prevented ease of reinforcement as well as communication. In addition, Mars now failed to repel the Dark Mechanicum and had fallen to the Warmaster's forces and as such had to be continually blockaded and prevented from launching its own attacks to Earth. Oh shit. As far as the Emperor, Malkador and Imperial Fists were concerned, the spearhead the name? Thank you very much. Really five appreciate had it. been a catastrophic failure. Other legions, such as the Ultramarines, were now completely isolated and out of contact, and so they could do nothing but watch the galaxy burn around them, as Horus himself had stated he would as he oversaw the virus bombing of Isfarn 3. Despite this period often being documented uh -huh. as clear-cut death guard against blood angels and so on, it was far more chaotic than this. Although battles and confrontations would occur, it was not as simple as the Warmaster declaring X Legion is now under my command. A legion comprised thousands of space marines, and they would rarely be all stationed in one location at once. Consequently, this fragmentation meant many could return from stationing elsewhere to find to their horror the truth of the matter. As outlined previously, although space marines can often appear to be mechanical machines of war, they are just as complex as any human in their thoughts, decisions and moralities, hence why Horus saw it necessary to slaughter so many loyalists from the legions he would call his own on Isfarn 3. This meant that many smaller groups of marines, when returning to communication with their legion, would either meet a bloody fate at the hands of their brothers should they refuse to convert to the Warmaster's cause, or instead they would flee to form fragmented groups of rare marines known as Black Shields. Black Shields? So a new type of marine is rising up here. Hmm. You know, it's kind of cool to have a massive empire that spans multiple galaxies and stars and shit, right? But that's also a fucking headache. <laughs> Just the, the sheer size of it makes it nigh impossible to get anything done. Which maybe that's why the emperor did it? Now just to diverge very quickly, Black Shields are a rare form of Astartes who have fully severed themselves from their parent legion or chapter, but who still remain loyal to the Imperium. In this early time however, only some of the marines would obscure their shoulder plates, others would wear their legion colours and heraldry proudly believing themselves to be the purest warriors, uncorrupted by the darkness and the last remnants of their previous but now ruined glory. Later in time though, all these rogue Astartes would black out their armour to remain anonymous as their legion loyalty became a deep shame and irrelevant to their personal missions. Black Shield Space Marines would later become the fabled Death Watch Marines, who dedicate themselves to endlessly battling Xenos using unorthodox methods and allying with fellow Black Shields whose prior legion heritage is irrelevant and often best unspoken of. It is uncommon for the Black Shield to reveal more than bare details other than his name, basic training experiences and so on. They fight in the name of the Imperium but remain in a state of self-imposed exile. The death Wait, so even now the the Black the 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 Black Shield on part of the Imperium. Not not officially. So even now to this day Nixty, if you're going to gift out subs, I'm not going to stop you. How you doing, by the way? What do you mean he's a bit wrong? Shishko, what do you mean he's a bit wrong here? Those black armors look cool. It does actually look cool. Death Watch are part of the Imperium. So they have joined the Imperium. And they're part of the Inquisit... Uh, the... Inquisition right now. Self-imposed exile. Mike, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first chat. Really appreciate that. Yeah, but the... So, chat seems to have different... Um... Like, different 
different sort of conclusions being drawn right now. Black shields are Horus Heresy practice, and they are not Death Watch. Okay. Oh, but Shish, I just want to say, though, uh, Newton didn't say that they became Death Watch during the Horus Heresy. He said they would later become Death Watch. Silly B, thank you so much for the follow. I really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. At this point, they were still Black Shields, right? Yeah, they eventually, they would, probably not just them, you know, there would probably be others also that would join or maybe start the Death Watch and these guys would become part of it. I don't know exactly, um, but I'm probably going to have to watch a little bit more and also read a bit before I would know what the actual truth there is. Watch Black Shield Marines would also fight in a manner divergent to normal Marines. They will willingly sacrifice themselves where necessary or take on objectives that others would consider a death sentence. In many ways, their lives seem to be a form of penance, carrying the shame and weight of sin thrown down by their legions upon their shoulders, but all the while remaining staunchly loyal to the Emperor. Horus continued his unending campaign of betrayal ah. now, in a bizarre parody of the Imperial Crusade, each world over which the Warmaster's shadow fell, a simple choice was given, total submission and surrender, or total destruction, and a lifetime of slavery, and ultimately, a miserable death. This campaign was also certainly one of fear-mongering and compliance for sibling worlds in a given system. For Dude, Horus? Um... So at what point, at what point did the Chaos Gods start, um, like, feeding Horus with power? League and Games, how you doing, bro? Because someone told me during the first one we watched that the Chaos Gods were f basically back when he was dying. No, but that took years. Like, it took a really long time for that to happen. Because effectively, the Chaos Gods were playing him, allowing him to sort of think he's actually fighting them in a way, right? So they would constantly feed him with more power, and as he got more powerful, he would be able to do more things. Horus becomes powerful as the heresy goes. Just came from Ruri's in yours last video. I love your podcast. Some really great and meaningful discussion. Steady B, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the stream. Um, this is also one of the very rare instances where all Chaos Gods gave Horus power, making him a champion of chaos. Doing great. Building my favorite NFL team helmet using Legos. It's my birthday day. Hey, happy birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, can we some happy birthdays in chat for Ligand Games? Any world marked for destruction and genocide was never fully extinguished in this manner. It would conveniently allow those survivors who had not simply lost their minds from witnessing the horrors unleashed by the Dark Astartes could convey their experience Horus is a to fucking other asshole, bro. Worlds, and thereby assuring their near immediate surrender to the Warmaster's fleet. In this sense, these near total annihilation attacks on planets by the Warmaster were not true exterminatus, as was seen on Isfahan 3, rather they were a clever and brutal propaganda tool to yet again demonstrate Horus's adept ability in the art of war he had perfected through the years of the Imperial Crusades. By now, some nine of the 20 Space Marine Legions were under the command of Horus. An interesting but specifically relevant aside to this is to mention the 2nd and 11th Space Marine Legions. Mm -hmm. They would have all records of their existence destroyed and no history or explanation given as to their origin, actions or fate. The complete and utter erasure of all records of the 2nd and 11th Legions is considered by Imperial historians as the most successful edict of obliteration ever carried out. Wait, so that happened during the Horus Heresy? Because the Emperor originally created 20 legions. 18, because two of them got completely erased. But, so we now learn that number 2 and number 11 were erased from everything.
It drives me fucking nuts that we don't know why they were erased. So this happened before the heresy. Nixie, thank you so much for the gifted subs. Really appreciate that. Hearts in chat. Gifted subs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, if I were to ask you in chat, give me your best theory as to why you think they were erased. Like, what's your, like, best effort guess? What would you have to do in order to get erased from uh from the fucking imperial records Part of their legion joined the Ultramarine. They are on a super covert black op to overthrow chaos. Got Thanos now, chaos. Married enough children with Xenos. My pet theory is that they mutated due to gene stealers. One theory is that one of the Primarchs sympathize with Xenos and prefers to coexist. Okay. The Marines that were part of those legions were absorbed by other legions. Stay at home, Brad. How you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. In a book, Malkador said that he erased Dawn's memory of their existence, and when he gave them back to Dawn and re-erased them, Dawn came to the conclusion that if they would still be here, the Imperium would have definitely lost. So they... Oh, okay. So they were absolutely... They, according to what you're saying there, uh, my noir, right? If they were still there, the Imperium would have definitely lost. They were almost guaranteed removed because of something they did or a threat that they posed. The Chamber at the end of memory, at least one of those two did something really bad. Yeah. Fuck Games Workshop for not actually telling, bro. Like, <laughs> fuck that, bro. However, fragments of information do exist through quoted literature or documents, and it seems that these two legions' records were eradicated prior to the Horus Heresy. We have no way of knowing for sure what happened to the erased two legions, but it seems likely they were precursors to the events of the Heresy. Mm-hmm. The Primarch of the Space Wolves, Lehman Russ, is recorded as stating that Space Marines had been previously tasked with fighting one another when speaking to Casper Horsaw, who questioned him. The unprecedented, like Astartes fighting Astartes, like the route being called to sanction another legion, that, no, that is not unprecedented. This gives credence to the possibility that the Space Wolves are the Emperor's preferred execution legion, as they Shroomy, um, it's a book, or books, uh, I believe someone said over 600 books in the series so far. It is primarily novels and a tabletop game, all right, so... Old Man Modo made this for me. I don't know how many of you have seen it. I got it today. We we did the unboxing today of this little fella. Let me make this bigger so you can see. That's my very own first miniature orc, right? And it's actually custom made. This was uh, 3D printed and it is based on me. So it's my profile picture being done as this, all right? So if you need custom paint jobs, just uh, contact Old Ben Moto. Uh, I'll have a link in the description down below of this video to his uh, sort of socials if you guys wanted to contact him. But this is the kind of thing that you're playing the game with, right? This is the tabletop. Uh, in tabletop, you'll have multiple of these and the, these would represent your armies and shit like that. So it's really fucking cool. And then they have the novels, but then they also have a shit ton of games. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. It really depends on the game. Like, yeah, some of them are dark crap. The one I'm playing right now, which is actually not too bad, 
is this one for the first time. I'm playing Dawn of War, uh, number one. I bought that one. Andy, how you doing, brother? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. I bought this. I played it for the first time. Can't believe that I fucking... Can't believe that it took me this long to discover this game. But it is an incredible game. Some of the others, less so. Less incredible. But just to show you what a fuck face their games are. So, here's all Warhammer games. Um, there's maybe like five or six of these that's decent, right? Okay, so this list is also fantasy stuff, and not all of it seems to be Warhammer stuff. At least the, the top parts of Warhammer stuff, right? Um, but yeah, so some of the games are really hit and miss. Uh, some of them good, some of them less good. It really depends. But um, Dawn of War is really good. I've heard Space Marine is really good. So they do have games, but they're more focused on tabletop and shit like that. It would be later tasked with the destruction of the Thousand Sons and Magnus the Red. Another quote stated that the wolves will be loosed again. This small fragment suggests it is not the first time they'd faced such a mission. Malkador the Sigilite and Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists would also shed some fragmented... Baldus, thank you so much for the follow, dude. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. ...light on this history. Malkador would say, Horus has three of his brother legions with him. You have your fists and 13 others. Would that it were 15, mused Dawn. Do not even think it, my friend, warned Malkador. They are lost to us forever. I know, said Dawn. Wait, what? You have your first and 13 others. Would that it were 15. Do not even think it, my friend. They are lost to us forever. Hmm. This would suggest that they were removed, but not entirely dead. Because the fact that he would say, would that it were 15, suggests there is a way to get them back. They, if he had to, he could go get them back. And then Malkador responds not with, well, you know, they're dead. He says, do not, do not even think it, my friend. They are lost to us forever. Lost to us, but not dead, not gone, just lost. Dude. This is fucking torture. Not knowing what happened to those two fucking lost chapters is torturing me now. I am not happy about this at all. A conversation between Primarch Rogal Dawn and Malkador the Sigilite, and this leads us to speculate that a great darkness caused them to be lost prior to heresy. All right, so I always like to, Lepecki, I always like to say, even in World of Warcraft, so it's difficult for people to oftentimes differentiate between lore and gameplay. Okay, so in World of Warcraft, a common misconception, for example, is teleportation. People think you can teleport anywhere, and that's true. You know, why don't you just teleport there? Whereas teleportation is made simple and easy in the game for gameplay reasons. But from a lore perspective, teleportation is only really possible by the most powerful of mages. Like your average mage isn't really going to be able to teleport. Um, or if they will, it's going to leave them incredibly weakened by the end of it. Because of reasons, law reasons, right, that we could go into. So I fully understand Games Workshop and their sort of argument around why they wanted to remove these two legions. I fully understand that. They wanted to give players the ability to make their own. I don't care about that, though, because to me, that is a gameplay reason and I find, yeah, sure, we can have the gameplay reasons. I'm interested in the lore reason. And 
lore-wise, you can't just have made those. You can't just have disappeared them because you wanted to give the players more things. There's an actual reason in the lore. Whether Games Workshop ever reveals that reason is not important, but we do know there must be an actual reason, right, for their disappearance. Um, you also need anchors to be able to save teleport to places. Yeah, there is a chance. Yeah, that's actually very true. Uh, there is a chance because there is a super secret group called the Cabal doing shit in the background, so the two could be with them, but I think Game Shop forgot about them. That is possible. But then there are no template rule uh, to use for them. Agree from a lore perspective, the two lost Primarchs have been the topic of a lot of discourse. Many things in the lore we don't know, we internally complete. I do think that... <coughs> Stories are full of shit like this, right? In Lord of the Rings, J.R. Tolkien, Tolkien um, had... Uh, what's the guy's name? Tom. Tom, the dude in the forest. No one ever knew anything about Tom. And whenever people would ask things about Tom, J.R. Tolkien would joke and just sort of be like, some things are just based not known. Tom is incredibly powerful. Tom effectively does have the power to rule over all things, but Tom doesn't. Tom just sort of chills, doesn't do anything. So in stories, it is sort of... It is nice to have these weird elements, right? These weird sort of things that keep your community discussing things. Like just constantly going, ah, but fuck, it could be this. Because it creates community. It creates that thing where... You want to talk about this because there's so little information about it, but that also makes it so interesting. But the most telling of all would be part of Horus's vision during his out-of-body experience on Davin, where he would have, among other delusions, a reminiscence back in time to the DNA laboratories of the Emperor. We know that the warp creatures had originally scattered the Primarchs, so it seems entirely likely that this vision was at least in part accurate. Horus would describe that. Mm -hmm. He stopped by the tank with eleven stenciled upon it. The eleventh Primarch, feeling the untapped glories that might have lain ahead for what grew within, but knowing that they would never come to pass. This could suggest that Chaos wanted to demonstrate to Horus that he was not the first to be corrupted, and that where previously they had failed and subsequently were destroyed by the Emperor, he would succeed. These glimpses are interesting, but do beg the question, if such a fate had befallen the 2nd and 11th legions, why was the Emperor not more cautious to allow such darkness to encroach and infect his Astartes again? On the other hand, mm -hmm. perhaps it was precisely these earlier corruptions which led the Emperor to his course of outlawing knowledge of chaos, the old adage of what you don't know can't hurt you. Yeah, what a stupid fucking argument to make. Yeah, we won't tell them. That way they won't know. It's like going, the best way for us to teach kids about sex is to just not teach them at all. Like, we won't tell them about STDs. Let that be a surprise. <laughs> it's sort of like, dude, no, kind of always the best thing is to give the knowledge so that you can make informed decisions about things. The Emperor made a lot of mistakes, bro. Like, a lot of mistakes. Additionally, perhaps the fact that if indeed these two now erased legions were corrupted and then crushed by the space wall... Evans, technically for the orcs, that would be true. If the orcs truly believe that your guns can't kill them, then your guns can't kill them, right? Like if all the orcs just together believe that, yeah, your guns can't shoot and they can't kill us, then your guns are not going to shoot and it's not going to kill you. But if you know, it can affect you more now. Ruby, would we say that it can though? Oh yes, but why would orcs want less Daka? No, they obviously don't want less Daka, they want more Daka. 
But technically speaking, while they can't make your guns not shoot, they can make your guns not hurt them, and that would be the warp thing. Uh, technically speaking, at least. Um, Rebuke, first and foremost, thanks for uh, the first time chat. Really appreciate that. And then to answer that question, I guess that's sort of like a philosophical question, right? Uh, is it better to know than to not know? What does the most harm? And I guess that would ultimately depend on who knows what. Mr. Barty, how you doing, bro? I originally saw your reactions on YouTube, joined the Discord, and I've been having a blast discussing lore. I am so fucking happy to hear that. I keep an eye on the Warhammer lore discussions and stuff, and it is nuts to me how much fucking people are chatting and discussing things in the lore. So I'm really happy to hear that people are enjoying the, the Discord. Easy P, thank you so much for the Prime Sub, did really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you know about the warp as no one, as no one, it can't affect you. Well, it can affect you if they learn about you, right? Um, if the warp finds out about you, they're going to come for you whether you believe in it or not, as is the case with Horus. Horus didn't know about the warp. He didn't know about the chaos, and uh, they ultimately came for him, right? There you go. There's the Discord invite link uh, for those of you that wanted to join Discord. Could this have lulled the Emperor into a false sense of security, believing any further corruptions to be also surmountable? We could speculate that the Chaos Gods perhaps even allowed these legions to be destroyed prior to the Horus Heresy so as to deliberately misdirect the Emperor into believing them to be weaker or less capable of force than they actually were. There is no definitive answer, this is all supposition, but the possibilities and ramifications are particularly intriguing. Whatever mm -hmm. the reasons for these prior events and the consequences they would carry, one thing was now certain. Horus's fleet seemed unstoppable as it approached Terra. Rogal Dawn and Malkador the Sigilite were receiving the fragmented survivors from the Isfahan 5 massacre at this time and began to realize the grim reality of what they were facing. They hurriedly attempted to contact the space. So, the right user, the problem with that analogy or the explanation you gave there is that's only true if we explain it exactly the way that you just said, which is obviously not how like a true explanation of the Chaos Gods would be. Because a part of that would also be that you are in for eternal suffering. You're in for eternal suffering. Um, sort of damnation, depending on which zone, you, uh, which chaos realm you join. If you go to Nurgle's realm, you're going to rot away, and you're going to look like a fucking, well, like snot, basically, right, uh, by the end of it. So you could actually, I think, make a, a quite a decent case for why you should probably not join the Chaos Gods. Space Wolves and White Scars, who, as they were about to return to Terra, were now engaged by the traitors of the Alpha Legion. This made retreat... No. Whilst you're rotting and already taken over by Nurgle, you would not notice the fact that you're rotting or, like, smelling and shit, right? You would not notice it. But remember, if the Emperor was still speaking to his legions, to his Space Marines, and to his Primarchs, they would not have been taken over. So if the Emperor told them about Nurgle and Slaanesh and the things that they do, they would have been fucking appalled at the idea of that. Which, of course, would have meant that they're probably not going to dive into that because fuck that, right? Uh, Baming, thank you so much for following. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Nurgle loves you, Akalon. Why would you reject his love? Nurgle can go suck... A monkey dick. Dude, Nurgle is disgusting beyond belief. What the fuck are you saying? I'm sorry, but no. No, 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 no. I don't care if you don't feel the pain of rotting. You look shit when you're part of Nurgle's realm. Just no way. If you are disconnected from the warp, you will feel the rotten pain. True. But Nurgle is the only good god in Warhammer? I disagree with that. 
like if you are going to take like a fucked up reality with chaos and shit i would go for slanesh at least you're gonna get fucked there and maybe do some fucking of your own right uh in with nurgle Maybe your penis fucking rots off, in which case you may as well die, but you can't because you're immortal. So what a fucking horrid existence that would be. Whereas uh, if you go to Slanesh's realm, maybe you get two penises, which obviously makes things infinitely fucking better. Go to the greater good. Seems pretty chill difficult but the white scars were able to break free to return to terror with the wolves vowing to follow them on once they had eradicated the alpha legion's force the ultramarines similarly had been engaged on the planet of kalth against the word bearers robert gilliman and the ultramarines received reinforcements from their vast legion to form one of the greatest forces in the imperium now left standing and mm -hmm. they would repel the shattered word bearers and set course for terror after receiving their communication from malkador However, Gilliman realized all wait, too I well that. they would Fuck, wait, 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 I missed that. Planet. Sigilite were receiving the fragmented survivors from the Isfahan 5 massacre at this time and began to realize the grim reality of what they were facing. They hurriedly attempted to contact the Space Wolves and White Scars, who, as they were about to return to Terra, were now engaged by the traitors of the Alpha Legion. This made retreat difficult, but the White Scars were able to break free to return to Terra with the Wolves vowing to follow them on once they had eradicated the Alpha Legion's force. The Ultramarines similarly had been engaged on the planet of Kalth against the Word Bearers. I see Ultramarines. Robert Gilliman and the Ultramarines received reinforcements from their vast Legion to form one of the greatest forces in the Imperium now left standing, and they would repel the shattered Word Bearers and set course for Terra after receiving their communication from Malkador. However, Gilliman realized all too well they would likely arrive too late to make a significant difference, as had Jesus, been the original ship. intention on posting them as far from Earth as was possible without it raising suspicion. Now the race was really on, as nearly all the Space Marine Legion's loyalist and traitor alike headed for holy terror to determine the final Here battle we go. for supremacy of the galaxy. Despite all their best efforts, only the White Scars, Blood Angels, and Imperial Fists were able to reach Terra before the Traitor Legions arrived. The Loyalists were also supported with three Mechanicus Titan Legions and millions of Imperial Guard soldiers. Their objective was less to defeat the Traitors, that task was not in anybody's mind. Their sole task was simple and twofold. They must protect the Emperor at all costs, and they must survive long enough for reinforcements from the remaining Loyalist Legions who were still en route to terror. The Battle of Terror. The Battle of Terror began as expected, with mass orbital bombardments from both the surface to orbit and vice versa. Luna, the Imperial Naval Station, also launched massive attacks with its huge orbital defense system, which sustained the traitors with heavy losses, but sadly not heavy enough to make any significant impact. Horus would destroy first the lunar defences and then the ground defence systems on Earth. It was now open to attack. The first drop pods landed on Terra, carrying the corrupted hellish Chaos Marines who battled the Loyalists for every step of ground they took. In securing the docking port's planet side, the traitors were able to reinforce with thousands more Marines along with the corrupted Dark Mechanicum Titans. Cultists also practiced their invocations, which brought demons large and small out from the warp and into Fuck. reality, unleashing their horrors on the loyalists, both Astartes and Imperial Guard alike. The forces of chaos assaulted the Imperial Palace relentlessly, some being led on by the Primarch, now turned demon Prince Angron of the World Eaters. But each time they attacked, the Blood Angels led by their Primarch Sanguinius would repel them. Sanguinius. The White Scars Legion attempted to draw the Dark Forces. Wait, isn't Sanguinius that dude that... Who's the guy that currently sort of roams the warp? Like, he, he is so fucking strong in his belief that the Chaos Gods have no effect on him. That it doesn't matter how much they try, the Chaos Gods can do fuck to him. Is that Corvus? Corvus Corax. It's the guy everyone has great Drago. Caldor Caldor Drago. Sanguinus, the strongest Primarch in martial prowess? 
glorious orc boy, Kaldor Drago, Kaldor Drago, and he's a gray knight. Ah. All right. All right. Okay, cool. So Corvus is the Primarch, and they're like the greatest, he has the greatest martial prowess. And then Kaldor Drago is the Grey Knight that is effectively impervious to any sort of chaos corruption. Away from the palace, but each time would be forced into submission, retreating back into the relative shelter of the palaces. Horus, frustrated at this point, and all too aware he was running. Okay, wait, wait. Sanguinus, yeah, yeah, okay, so Sanguinus is the greatest. Who the fuck is Corvus Corax then? The Corvus is in the warp, hunting the Primarch of the Word Bearers, of the Raven God who left the 40k to battle Chaos in the warp. But why do you guys say he's shit? What makes him shit? No, he's not shit. Well, everyone everyone has their own sort of <laughs> ideas about characters in the 40k universe. <laughs> Running out of time, ordered one of the Titan Legions to demolish entire sections of the Imperial War. Despite grievous losses, the Titans, led by the infamous Imperator class battle titan Disarray, smashed breaches in the Imperial Palace's defences, which the traitors then flooded through. Jakati Khan, Primarch of the White Scars, decided at this time on a change in tactic. Instead of trying to repel the seemingly endless forces of Chaos Marines, he swept a lightning raid to the Lion's Gate spaceport, catching the traitors at the port completely off guard. They were able to secure it quickly and reactivate the orbital defences, which began immediately destroying all descending traitor drop pods and landing transports. Good in boy. A single action, Good boy. They had cut the reinforcements of the traitors in half and dealt a substantial blow. They also tried to secure the second main port known as the Eternity Wall, but were unsuccessful as the Chaos forces had now reinforced their positions. The battle at the main palace was not going well now either, and the loyalists had been pushed back to the Eternity Gate, the sole point of entry into the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. The Marines, the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists were to hold back the attacking Chaos forces while the remaining Loyalists made it through the gate to safety. Sanguinius, the Blood Angels Primarch, would now face a terrifying prospect as he flew against a greater demon of Khorne, clashing oh together head on as they battled in the air, flying above the mortal forces in a ferocious and blurring battle of godlike ability. Sanguinius would ultimately be victorious, breaking the demonic creature and throwing its shattered body to the howling oh. heretics below. Sanguinius Gigachad! The Warpgate project the Emperor had secretly been working on resided in this chamber, and it now risked becoming their undoing. Initially, it required only a small portion of the Emperor's psychic attention, but after the damage wrought by Magnus of the Thousand Sons in attempting to reach the Emperor, it subsequently was damaged so badly that it required a significantly higher proportion of the Emperor's powers to keep it closed. Combined with the fact that the forces of Chaos were fighting to use this portal, it became an immense burden to maintain it safely. The Emperor ah. now called on Malkador the Sigilite, informing him that he was required to take his place on the psychic amplifier known as the Golden Throne. This provided the psychic shielding needed to protect the new, human-built sections of the webway, which had been the Emperor's secret project and was intended to be the final gift to humanity before- Wait, the Emperor was actually building the ability for humans to travel without having to enter the warp. Fuck, imagine if he fixed that. More like Malkador the Sketchy. Or the Horus Heresy had begun. 
The Emperor's original choice of his replacement on the artifact had been Magnus the Red, but now Malkador was the only legitimate successor, being one of the few human remaining psychers with enough strength to carry out the duty. In the final days of the siege, the Emperor ordered Malkador to summon 12 men of character, skill and determination. These would be tested and trained to become an elite group of investigators intended to root out treachery across the Imperium and in the centuries to come to prevent any event the like Inquisitor the Horus Heresy Inquisition. from occurring again. This would become the earliest stirrings of the Inquisition and also later the highly secretive chapter known as the Grey Knights. The Emperor oh. also told Malkador to steal himself as he would need to prepare to make an unbearable sacrifice. Malkador would return from his mission to recruit the foundation of the Inquisition. Using his powerful psychic subterfuge, Malkador and his new recruits were able to pass unscathed through the battle lines and come before the Emperor within the inner gates of the Imperial Palace. Malkador brought before the Emperor his 12 men to be judged for their suitability, and the Emperor saw that Malkador had chosen wisely. Of the 12, four um, were mortal lords. Before I continue with this, that would become the Inquisitors, which I actually fucking love. Who was Magnus the Rad? And why could Magnus the Rad not take the throne? Who was actually poised to do so? What led to the Emperor having to choose Malkador over Magnus? Magnus fell. Oh, yeah. Fuck, for a second I was completely lost. For a second I was completely lost as to who Magnus... Magnus, the Thousand Suns guy, the guy that the Emperor thought was the first to turn to chaos, but actually didn't turn to chaos until the Emperor fucking ruined him. Okay, I remember. I remember now. Okay. The, the Emperor... The, yeah, I'm just gonna say again, the Emperor made a bunch of oopsies that led to some crazy shit. Lords and administrators of the Imperium possessing an inquisitive nature and unyielding strength of mind. The other eight were Space Marines, whose abilities were as peerless as their dedication to the Emperor. Some Marines were from legions that had abandoned the Emperor in favour of Horus' dark promises, but these Battle Brothers had never lost their staunch loyalty and had fought the heresy from within in many ways, and they were the truest expression of the Imperium and carried an even stronger will than their Lord Primarchs. Malkador the Sigilite ascended to the Golden Throne, replacing the Emperor who stood before his loyal captains, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists and Sanguinius of the Blood Angels. Malkador could no longer physically speak, his mind consumed by the concentration he had to bring to bear in order to control the tempest of psychic forces consuming him. Fuck. The Emperor directed the attention of the two Primarchs, the demigods of mankind, to look upon this mere mortal. Malkador, a powerful psyker, but not an Astartes, not a Primarch, just a man. The Emperor declared to them, Behold, the greatest sacrifice of our age. Malkador the Sigilite is no more. Henceforth, he shall always and only ever be Malkador the Hero. Malkador would only be able to withstand the psychic assault on him for a few hours. Powerful as he was, he was but a fraction of the power of the Emperor, and his body, mind and soul would be consumed in a matter of hours. Malkador the Sigilite was a true hero of humanity, saving it from total destruction on numerous occasions, ultimately sacrificing himself for the will of his friend, the Emperor. After 55 days, the Siege of Terror had kept the enemy at the- Why did the Emperor do this? Because he could only last for a few hours and then he was fucked. Did the Emperor know that he was going to die? Gates, but only just. Both sides knew the defeat of the Imperium was near and all that was required was the defense or destruction of the Eternity Gate. Horus, knowing this and that he must complete the siege before the arrival of the Loyalist reinforcements from the other Space Marine legions, prepared to teleport to the surface from his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, to lead this final assault in person. 
The word bearer's first chaplain and prime traitor Erebus broke the news to Horus that their demonic allies in the warp had informed them the Dark Angels and Space Wolf legions were now nearing terror, and the vast force of Ultramarines were only a short distance away by now. Hearing this news, Horus despaired. All seemed lost. He needed more time to break the most secure enclave of the Imperial Palace, and the massive Imperial reinforcements were only hours away. Horus decided on a dangerous gamble. Dropping the shields of his flagship, he opened the gateway for the Loyalists to board his vessel. The Emperor would not waste this opportunity and teleported aboard the Vengeful Spirit with his elite personal guard, the Legio Custodes. The Primarch Sanguinius and Rogel Dawn, several companies of Imperial Fists and Blood Angels, veteran marines in the assault. Finding themselves though scattered now throughout the ship, they fought a series of close quarter battles against hardened Chaos Marines to reach the bridge of the ship and Horus. Sanguinius, the Blood Angel's Primarch, reached his brother Horus first, and the Warmaster attempted to turn his previously oldest and closest friend among the other Primarchs to Chaos one last time. When Sanguinius refused to be corrupted, Horus attacked. Wounded from his many battles on terror and the battle with the greater demon, Sanguinius proved to be easily no match for Horus. He was now at the peak of his demonic power, bearing multiple marks of chaos. Horus strangled to death the angel with cruel ease. An alternate version of this event recorded in the Imperial Records has Sanguinius cutting a small hole in Horus's Terminator armor before he died. This chink in the armor would aid in the Emperor's battle against Horus. When the Emperor entered the bridge, he saw the winged corpse of the angelic Sanguinius lying at Horus' feet. Horus engaged the Emperor, calling him foolish for refusing the power that Chaos offered. Horus proclaimed that if the Emperor would kneel before him, he would spare his life. The Emperor knew well the ancient trap that had snared Horus. And the Emperor told the corrupted Primarch that he was the deluded slave of Chaos, not its master, for no mortal could ever truly claim to be more than a simple pawn of the ruinous powers. Snarling with frustration, Horus hurled bolts of demonic lightning at the Emperor, who nullified them before they touched him. The Emperor and Horus would engage one another in the throne room of the massive battle barge, a combat of both it's physical enough. skill and psychic force in nature. The Emperor was unquestionably the most skilled and powerful warrior, but his love for his sons could not bring himself to bear his full- This is another mistake! Just fucking end him! But he loves his son so much that he doesn't want to fight with all his power. Fuck, man! ...all strength against Horus, his first son. The Emperor would deflect multiple barrages with his lightning claw, but Horus was possessed, relentless, and sliced open the Emperor's chest armor. He then proceeded to sever the tendons in the right wrist, disarming the Emperor. An enraged psychic blast from the War Master seared the flesh from the Emperor's face, destroying one of his eyes, tearing the broken Emperor's right arm from his socket. Horus raised his father's broken ragdoll body high over his head to throw him down, breaking his body. The vicious and casual brutality of the War Master's act galvanized the now broken Emperor, as he awoke to what awaited mankind under the rule of Horus and the Chaos Gods. Realizing at last that his favored son was wholly lost to the corruption of Chaos, the Emperor gathered his full psychic power, bringing it through his body and into the Immaterium, unleashing a lance of pure energy that pierced the gloating Horus's psychic defenses. The Emperor, in a white-hot rage, pierced his very being with psychic power. Before Horus died, the Chaos Powers would abandon him. And as he looked his father in the eye, shedding a single tear, realizing his unforgivable betrayal, begging his father to forgive him. The Emperor saw regret oh in his fallen God. son's eyes, but the Emperor also knew that the Dark Gods could attempt to possess Horus again, and that this time he would not be there to stop them if they did. Forcing all compassion from his mind for the sake of humanity, the Emperor tore his soul apart, not banishing or casting it to some dark realm, but erasing it from reality, destroying Jesus. Horus utterly. His essence burned from existence in both the physical world 
and the Immaterium, so that Chaos could not Dude, resurrect what the Horus, but their claim on his soul, a bitter blow to the Dark Gods, who would scream a terrible psychic scream in their rage and frustration. The destruction of Horus' soul sent a psychic shockwave surging across the solar system, casting the demons of Chaos back into the warp and spreading a mass panic among wow. the traitor legions and other traitor forces on the surface of Terra, who felt in fractions of seconds the weakening power and loss of the Chaos mark upon them. It became clear to the traitors their leader had been defeated. In this moment, a terrible berserker fury, later to become known as the Black Rage, encompassed the Blood Angels. From the moment of their Primarch Sanguinis' death, they went out surging forth to scatter oh, the attackers, go. slashing in all directions, howling vengeance upon them. The already retreating traitor legions ran for their lives, screaming in terror from the frenzied Blood Angels. Oh, here we go. The screaming retreat soon turned to an apocalyptic bloodbath. Thousands upon thousands of Chaos Space Marines, as well as the Chaos Titans, fell, attempting to flee. Any who fell behind were obliterated by the Blood Angels. Many of them would be later found still wandering around in an insane rage, smashing the broken Chaos Space Marines to pieces with apparently little conscience, thought or control. The ground before the Imperial Palaces was now awash with blood of traitors and heretics. Dude, okay, so I have a couple of... Um How? Because Luton didn't say here that it was the Emperor's sword that deleted Horus from fucking, like, literally control alt a Ford him from existence. Um, was it the sword? Or was that just the Emperor? I've lost every semblance of control, and there is nothing in the universe that could have stopped them in that moment. Nate, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It wasn't his sword. It was like a beam of literal pure energy. No, it was not. It was the Emperor's powers. Jesus. The, the Emperor is definitely not a mere mortal. Like, or a, a human. Definitely not. If you, as a human, have the power of the material and the immaterial, and of the warp and of reality, you are not really human. Patlin Haidem. So it can permadeath demons too, though? I know he's a perpetual. So I've learned about perpetuals already, but his insistence on being treated as just a, no a, a normal human is misplaced. This is the one of the ways to destroy a demon. A psychic attack so strong it destroys the demon's essence. No, he is the greatest of the chaos gods. Sigmar held on himself. Yeah, but Sigmar is fantasy. We're we're looking at 40k here. Um, I would recommend after this watch the Templin Institute video on the Emperor. The Emperor is not yet a chaos god, but he's nearly there. Uh, so Zar, I should say, Apocalypse is a fantasy fanboy. Um... And I'm assuming Sigmar is sort of like the emperor of the fantasy world. Uh, whereas, obviously, in 40k, we have the emperor, which is the emperor. He's the pinnacle of human potential, human in essence, but taken to the limit. Meanwhile, the Imperial Fist's Primarch Rogal Dawn finally found his way to the corrupted Starship's bridge, only to discover his brother Sanguinius and the shattered and broken body of the emperor who was now, despite his near-immortal powers, on the very real verge of death. His remaining psychic energy spent in the defense of the Golden Throne and subsequent battle with Horus. The Emperor whispered instructions to Dawn, ordering him to transport him to the device known as the Golden Throne in the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. If there was any chance to save the Emperor's life, Dawn would of course do so, without question. Returning to the Golden Throne Room deep in the Imperial Palace, Dawn and the frail body of the Emperor arrived just as Malkador was beginning to fail. His body had been consumed by the immeasurably powerful psychic storms that were now visibly lashing his body. As the tech priests hastily adapted the throne to be able to support the Emperor, Malkador was disconnected. 
Within minutes of this, though, his husk of a body would turn to dust, blowing Jesus. across the stone floor. But not before he reached out with the very last of his life energy and transferred it to the Emperor, giving him that last injection of power needed to survive for the moments until he could be transferred to the Golden Throne. This last act of Malkador was another blessing. Normally, killing a demon would send them back to the warp, but killing a demon with the Emperor's sword will destroy their very being, making them un unable to regenerate in the warp. Right now, in the current age, the Emperor's sword is Rubo... 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 Primarch of the Ultramarine's main weapon. So, you could potentially even kill a Chaos God with the sword of the Emperor. from the sigilite as the imperial attendants Malkador is a fucking giga chat true many times over and so began the almost endless task of locating and bringing psychers to holy terror to have the honor of being sacrificed and transferred their energy to the emperor to keep his spirit alive and also to keep the door of the raging imperial webway shut this last energy from Malkador would allow the emperor to speak his final commands to continue the fight to free humanity from the forces of chaos, as well as the ignorance that continued to assail it. With these final words, he would be silent, his body now entombed within the mechanisms of the Golden Throne, his body shattered, but his spirit remaining forever strong. He would command the Imperium through his psychic hints and emanations, interpreted and carried out by the High Lords of Terror. I'm not going to lie to you, this is the most sort of sad existence that any, any human being can ever have. I'm sorry. Just in one spot forever and ever more. You can't speak, actually. You can just sort of... Notion. Because according to what Luton is saying here, he doesn't actually psychically speak to them. He'll give them hints as to stuff that he wants them to do. But what's worse is he still maybe literally see what has become of his beloved Imperium. If there is any sort of, uh, shall we say, consciousness left within the Emperor, he can see how he's become a god to the humans. He can see how the humans have turned their back on science, and yet there's nothing he can do about it. He just has to accept this is it, you know. This is my life. Psychic Servitor now? Isn't human worship of him slowly morphing him into a god? Apparently, uh, apparently that is what ultimately will happen. Well, if, if what I know about the warp to be true, then yes, eventually that is exactly what is going to happen. If what I know about worship, uh, about, because every single human being in the universe that serves the emperor and believes in the emperor is sending all of that information into the warp. Now, the Eldar, through their depra depravity and their bullshit, was able to literally create a god of depravity because they were sending that shit into the warp. So it is effectively the same thing. Right? It is effectively the same thing. Humans will ultimately eventually create the Emperor God in the Chaos Realms. Far from a broken shell, the Emperor would continue to support the Imperium, protecting them by shielding the webway, keeping the beacon of light, the Astronomicon used by Imperial navigators, shining in the darkness, and some say the Emperor still now battles the forces of chaos on their own plane of existence, keeping the worst and most insidious demons from entering the material world or infecting the minds of suggestible men. Humanity had survived the darkest time, but at what cost? Hundreds of worlds stood destroyed or still now infected by the insanity of chaos. Mm -hmm. Half the Imperial forces had turned traitor and now began to retreat into the dark depths of the galaxy or the Eye of Terror itself. 
Many previously prosperous worlds were now considered unsavable, and consequently Imperial fleets would arrive to perform exterminatus on these damned worlds, destroying all life on the planet, reducing it to an orbiting rock. Fuck! The Imperium itself, despite the Emperor's best wishes, would struggle to maintain the sense of bright order once enjoyed during the Crusades. Now it would enter a difficult period, in many ways not too far removed from the 21st century where states of repression and ignorance were often widespread and caused many of the problems they would face. The Imperium operated on a new level of suppression of its citizens and in many ways it's hard to really find fault with this rationale. Given the severe blow to their military power, the Lords of Terror and remaining Primarchs needed to hold everything together amid- I wouldn't, um, Apocalypse, the, the argument, uh, from Zeech's side stole, the problem with that would be, they are not mortal, they are not human, therefore they must be the enemy. Because they, they are also not willing to accept us as we are. They want to change us into beings that resemble more their own. So I would argue that they are still the devil. But of course, evil is a sense of perspective. Um, the oppressor for one is the hero for another. So yeah, for the chaos gods, the emperor is the bad guy. Um, but of course... That's not true on our side. The Emperor has such an influence in the warp that he even resurrects Saint Celestine every time she dies, as long as she passes the test. Still? Even now? Pulling Quill, thank you so much for the follow. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a crumbling empire a still angry and battling traitor force who was still present throughout the galaxy and imperial systems, worse still was that the Xenos forces such as the Orc, Eldar and later Tyranids would seize on this opportunity to exploit humanity in its weakened state and would descend to ravage imperial worlds that were unable to be successfully defended during this time. Yeah, of course. Despite all this, the Imperium of Man would stand strong and whilst far from the perfect empire the Emperor had sought to create, it would still represent humanity's best hope for survival. They were not cut off and isolated as they had been during the Age of Strife and in some respects would regain much of their strength in the coming 10,000 years. Yeah, much of their strength? I don't know about that. I've seen some videos about life in the Imperium and I'll... Uh, much of their strength is uh, still a long ways off. Life is fucked in the Imperium in the 41st century or millennium. Now at the end of the Horus Heresy, the Imperium of Man was far from what you would call secure, but it had taken back control of the offensive and the traitor legions. These were now fleeing with gathering haste from the territories of mankind. Yeah, it literally is just a case of survival. And there's that common trope um, that, that you kind of have to start asking yourself if... If this is what you're fighting for, so the absolute misery that exists for humanity in the 41st millennium, is it even worth fighting for, right? Billy, by the way, thanks for the first time chat, dude. Really appreciate that. Hello, I've been binging your Warhammer content. Nice. Last week or so, I'm also a recent convert into the Imperium. Love your curiosity and excitement. Dude, this universe is fucking nuts, dude. It is so interesting. The primary source of strength for the Imperium now lay with the Ultramarines Legion. They were in a relatively... Disruptor! Thanks for the deal and stuff, did really appreciate that. Seven months in a row! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Far too kind, sir. ...unique position of having unintentionally suffered very little damage from the heresy, being ordered to a posting far from the activities of Horus and his traitor fleet. Mm -hmm. Arriving too late to have any real impact on the final battles of terror, Robo Gilliman found to his horror and frustration that the Emperor had already been wounded beyond repair and uncountable swathes of marines killed in defense of the Imperial palaces. 
the Loyalist legions had suffered immense casualties, be it on Isfahan, Terra, or any of the myriad engagements between. Dude, and that must be horrible. Nothing of the appalling losses suffered by the millions of Imperial Guard and Mechanicum, in addition to the many worlds that were totally lost or also destroyed at this point. One saving grace for the Imperium was that the Ultramarines had been excluded from the campaign due to their significantly larger size than most other legions. Horus feared... If the Ultramarines were on Earth, I'm assuming, or on Terra, I'm assuming the battle would have gone very differently. They, Horus would probably not have been able to make a dent if the Ultramarines were actually present on Earth. So many bad choices, fuck! Fuck! So many bad choices, bro. The Ultramarines, especially, as they were some of the most tactically able, the most uncorruptible, and most importantly, their overwhelming weight of numbers. Many legions in the time of the Crusade were recruited from the territories that they marshaled. The Ultramarines, through sheer fortune, had gathered a force of somewhere in the region of 250,000 Space Marines. Compared Jesus. to a more average 100,000 of the other strongest legions in this period. Although size could vary from anything like 50 to 150,000, the size of a legion was determined often by external factors, and there were no strict rules about its limitations. It was more a case of the number of incoming new recruits, the inevitable battle losses, the availability of potential recruits, and the administrative. Well, it was still the big E because. The Big E didn't believe that Horus had turned against him. This is why Horus had the ability to order the Ultramarines to go away. If the Big E simply believed Magnus at the time, none of this would have fucking happened. The skills of the Primarch and his officers. Gilliman was a great organizer and always pragmatic in his approach. Also, by coincidence, the system in which the Ultramarines were situated happened to have an especially plentiful supply of suitable new recruits who were excellent stock for genetic adaption into Astartes. The size of the Ultramarines was particularly important at this time, as the traitor legions had themselves suffered massive losses and were now without their primary leader, Horus. Mm -hmm. Disorganized, fearful, and in some cases overcome with guilt and regret. This disorganization enabled Gilliman to capitalize on the situation, spreading his ultramarine force far and wide across the Imperium, enabling the other Loyalist legions to consolidate their forces and in some cases restock from any new recruits who were already in the program of conversion to full Astartes. They were speeded through their training. The tra I know what, the human, what, what humans need to do. I can solve humanity's problems Easy peasy lemon squeezier. Take a hundred at a time and turn all mortals into space marines. Name a force in the galaxy that could stand against a full space marine army numbering in the billions. Yeah, but space marines don't need to have children. Not always survive the transformation. You think the Necrons could take a full space marine army? Woodland man, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. Gene seed is limited. Uh, what if they got corrupted? Legio Custodus, Tyranids, Necron. Necrons and Tyranids. Gene seed uh, derogation, so you can't. That's not his goal. He wanted to save humanity. Space Marines are not human. Yeah, but fuck his goals, dude. I'm pretty sure this was also not his goal, but it's happened now. There's nothing you can really do about it. Prison, uh, because he would just pull out some hitherto unknown giga weapon. Yeah, that could probably happen. Uh, the Necrons have weapons that literally cause stars to supernova at whim. Jesus. Traitors, on the other hand, had little opportunity for this, as the Ultramarines would block any attempt they would make to try and secure supplies or new recruits for their damaged legions. 
not to mention being continually harassed and assaulted by the Black Guard Death Watch, fighting now with renewed vigour. Some sought supreme vengeance for as they sought the destruction of their once proud legions and moreover the beloved Emperor himself. They wasted no time in immediately executing any corrupted traitors they found and would assist planets in crushing human cultists where they sprang forth. The newly established Inquisition at the command of the Emperor prior to his battle with Horus enabled the Imperium to have a fully established force to keep a watchful eye over any signs yeah, but now of they're chaos, religious zealots. caution and paranoia that the Interrex civilization had approached it with many years during the negotiations of Horus and the Lunar Wolves. This Inquisition would later be supported by the Grey Knights. The Grey Knights are a highly secretive wing of the Imperial Space Marine forces dedicated to the sole task of locating and eliminating the taint of dark corruption and battling the Imperium's most lethal and f The Inquisitors have my favourite saying in this entire game. The Inquisitor saying, Innocence proves nothing. By far my favourite saying in the entire game. My... Second favorite one is uh, uh, the planet failed before the guard did. Cadia still stands. That's my second favorite quote. But my um, my favorite one is innocence proves nothing. That is such a harsh fucking saying, dude. So harsh. Foul enemies. This period now would become known as the Great Scouring and the Ultramarines, along with the other recovering Loyalist Legions, would carry out the Emperor's last passing words to the letter. Although many traitor Marines fled in disarray, it became apparent in the years to come that some had established defensive bastions on distant worlds. It would take decades to cause enough damage to the Legions of the Night Lords, the Alpha Legion and the Iron Warriors before they too would retreat to the abhorrent safety of the Eye of Terror. After this period of cleansing, the Imperium needed to take stock of its Gun, that is pretty cool. <laughs> and plan for the future. This period would be referred to as the Reformation. Uh -huh. The Dark Forces had for the most part been vanquished, but the problem facing the Loyalists now was how to proceed. A plan was required before they could attend the task at hand, namely rebuilding, expanding and protecting the Imperial Empire. Reboot had firmly taken a leading command in these matters, and it would be he who provided the blueprints for the Imperial forces for the next 10 millennia. As Reboot saw it, the main cause of the heresy was less emotional than some of his brothers would have you believe. Mankind would always be unstable, and this instability needed to be accounted for. Therefore, placing a legion of space marines in the hands of one man, no matter how godlike that man was, could inevitably lead to problems. The Warmaster had been able to command many legions, each comprising hundreds of thousands. Wow, he's actually, he's actually fucking smart. Now, he's actually learning from his mistakes. ...of superhuman warriors. Gilliman saw that this was a dangerous position to allow anyone other than the Emperor himself to hold, knowing the truth now that Primarchs were just as susceptible to persuasion as a mortal human. It would be irresponsible to allow the existing structure of the Astartes legions to continue. Gilliman would now separate. Plays why? Thanks for the follow. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gilliman, so far, is a fucking Chad. True. The establishments of the Imperial military, creating and encouraging rivalries between them. In so doing, he hoped this would mean that they were less likely to be persuaded by one another should heresy occur again, and make it far more difficult for any one section to mobilize and carry out a significant campaign before it could be crushed. Prior to the end of the heresy, the Imperium had been overseen by the Council of Terror. These individuals managed the day-to-day -day running of the Imperium, but had been resented by the Primarchs for being mere mortals, as they were refused from partaking in these activities themselves. As the Emperor had instructed Malkador to find a new group of highly trusted, loyal and mentally strong individuals, some of these figures would now replace the Council of Terror of to take their place as the High Lords of Terror. These figures would rule the Empire of Man for the many thousand of years to come. The High Lords would use the psychic whispers of the Emperor and interpret these to carry out his will and organize and manage the Imperium. The most significant change was you can kind of see 
how humanity turned the emperor into a god. Think about every single mythological religious text we have. God does not speak with you in words, right? God comes to you in dreams, in thoughts, in visions, which is how the emperor right now communicates. Right? That's how the emperor speaks to any and all of his followers is through thoughts, visions, um, reminiscence sort of thing, right? So clearly over time, they started to regard this as, as a form of godhood. Something something that only a god would ever truly be capable of doing. I want the iron cage to be brought up. Does that we must be ruled by him? The god of the emperor reminds me of another story in a recent game. <laughs> and creating imperial da uh, demon friends. I mean, living saints. You yeah, pretty much right. Uh, don't give a right, That'd be funny. Wait, does that mean Azeroth is a god? She speaks in dreams and prophets. Well. In World of Warcraft terms, Azeroth would be a god, right? She's a titan. Titans are similar, at least. Gold, uh, god told me uh, to be a sub to Aklon. That's true, though. Uh, the, if the Emperor so moves you, give me your prime sub. Um, and the Emperor should. He told me. I, I am definitely part of the Imperium of Man. Sometimes I wonder if the Emperor changed his mind and encouraged worship of him after the Horus Heresy and he was placed on the Golden Throne. So Longbow, from what I understand from what people in chat are saying, the Emperor no longer has human thoughts and also I don't think the human uh, the Emperor can communicate insofar as trying to communicate you should worship me as a god. I think it is purely down to being communicated primarily um, or well, the only way to communicate with the emperor is primarily through visions, dreams, and, and premonitions. They have accepted that he must be a god, right? That, that he must be more than a mere mortal. He can he cannot be human because this is not how humans speak to each other. This is not how humans behave, but this is how gods behave. And also, um, from my own sort of thinking on this, it's not like humanity was without religion before the emperor. Before the emperor, there was a lot of religion. One might make the argument that we are biologically predisposed to being religious. This is why if even people who claim to be atheist will be religious about things. So you have people that is religious about science, for example. Um, sure, they believe in science, but they believe in science the same way a Christian would believe in God. Um, human beings are, at our core, religious beings. And it sort of makes sense that in the absence of an emperor that sort of wills rationality and wills meaning, um, they would re sort of revert to having um, something more physical but something more mysterious, and therefore the Emperor becomes a god. ...was also the most obvious. <clears throat> the Space Marine Legions had clearly caused the majority of the damage, and it was their immense size that was the root of the problem. And so Robert Gilliman would enact the second founding of the Space Marines. Seven years after the death of Horus and the final traitors had largely fled from the systems of the Imperium, the remaining Loyalist Legions would now be divided up from their hundreds of thousands of Marines into smaller 1,000 men strong chapters. The Legionis Astartes would now be known as the Adeptus Astartes. It was not a universally Adeptus. agreed plan though. Rogel Dawn and Lehman Russ would object strongly to their beloved Legions being essentially disbanded. But Khan mm -hmm. and Corex of the White Scars and Raven Guard would side with Gilliman. The newly appointed High Lords of Terror also concurred with Gilliman that it was necessary to change to the system, and so this resolution would pass. Gilliman would also, in addition to these overall organisational changes, implement a new code of conduct for the Space Marines to follow, his fabled Codex Astartes. This laid out the rules and guidelines on proper organisation, tactics and order of battle for a Space Marine chapter. 
It also laid down strict rules to avoid the dangerous orders that came to pass during the heresy, such as the Divinian Lodge practice which Horus enabled and subsequently would lay the seeds of betrayal within the legions. Needless to say, this is strictly illegal within the modern Astartes chapters. Yeah. The Codex, for many other chapters of Marines, was a helpful guide on structure and practice, but for the Ultramarines, it represented the Gospel Word as laid down by their Primarch, and it would soon become a sacred tome for the Ultramarines, who would follow it as a strict and almost fanatical code by which they would live their lives, as would the many sibling chapters who were created from the vast Everything, humanity is just, humanity is just fucked as soon as... As soon as something can become religious, it becomes religious. Russ actually had a point for his objection. Turns out his gene seed wasn't stable enough. Fuck. Best things to watch after this is the creation of Space Marines by Luton. It will answer your questions why not everyone can become a Space Marine. The Ultramarines and the we'll watch all of it. Seed would provide. Despite Gilman's pride in his Codex, some chapters like the Blood Angels, Dark Angels and Space Wolves adopted the Codex's guidelines only in part as a sign of their continuing disagreement with the choices being made. And additionally, perhaps the fact that Gilliman was allowed to dictate the future structure of the Astartes when he had played very little actual role in the defense of terror during the heresy. Mm -hmm. Putting their grievances aside though, it was clear to any looking in objectively that no other Primarch than Gilliman was better suited to this task than he. The Emperor's vision of a human civilization free from superstitious cults and irrational plans was far from successful. So Zephyrus, if you would permit me, uh, or maybe tolerate me, for a moment just taking it to the real world, that's the mark of a good writer. Right? to keep things as close to what reality would be. Human beings are incapable of religious thought. We are absolutely incapable of it. Uh, this is why uh, Voltaire, literally towards the end of his days, Voltaire wrote, God is dead and we have killed him. A lot of people celebrate that as sort of uh, Voltaire expressing his victory, right? The victory that they had had in killing religion. When you read the full passages from Voltaire, Voltaire is not actually sort of gleefully uh, stating their victory mantra. He's actually stating the opposite. He's saying God is dead and we have killed him. And I fear that we have removed the foundation from which humanity is built or on which humanity is built. Um, his problem was that without religion, what happens to humanity? What happens to all of our institutions, our trust, our levels of cooperation – if you remove religion. Today we see what humans have done without religion. We have made politics religion, thereby believing that anyone that isn't part of our political party is a heretic and should be killed uh, or could be killed effectively. We believe that violence against those who do not agree with us is warranted if they believe in what we quote unquote believe to be the wrong thing. That's religious thought. Sorry, but that is religious thought. Right? If you believe that your political party is so pure and so perfect that the other party is evil, then you are in a religion and you are religious about your political party. We've made sports religion, right? We watch sports and we pray at the altar of sports and we hate those who do not follow the same teams as we do religiously. Uh, money has become a religion for certain people. The issue, of course, is that none of those religions are actually sustainable. Now, I'm not trying to make a case here for religion being good, but there is a sort of, I almost want to say maybe it, it has to do with our own weaknesses as human beings. When we worship something like God, right, or Allah or Buddha, something that is greater than ourselves and that we cannot actually see, so if you're worshipping something that, sort of a divinity, if you will, it's almost as if that is enough to satiate us. And I'm not talking about people who sort of just claim to be Christian because that's the cool thing to be, right, if they want to make money. I'm talking about people who truly believe. It seems like that's enough. Our monkey brains find that worship enough. But when we look to things like politics and we turn those into religions— it's more superficial, 
right? It's not enough to sustain us, and therefore we constantly have to include new religions, like new religious types of thought. It's very interesting. It's it's very interesting. Uh, Mika Sarah, thanks for the follow. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. When you break humanity down and you sort of go, religion wasn't first. Religion came because uh, we're human and we need it. It's something that we can't live without. For all of our, you know, pre pretense of how evolved we are, we're still just monkeys and we need to believe in something. Um, Czar, I don't agree with the idea that religions are abused. I don't think so. I don't believe with the fucking thing of religions have led to war, religions have led to persecution. I don't believe in that. I believe humans lead to war. I believe humans lead to persecution. I believe humans, for as much as we have the ability to be kind and good, we have the ability to be incredibly evil and bad. It doesn't matter what religion it is. We will find a way to fucking murder and war regardless of the religion. Doesn't matter. If you want evidence of this, the Buddhists... Buddhists, Buddhism preaches zero violence, zero violence. And the Buddhists were leading a fucking genocide in China at one point in time, right? The Buddhists were leading it. Buddhism does not preach violence in any way, shape or form, and they were doing it. Why? Because that is human nature. If we didn't have religion, we'd murder each other for something else. But we would find a way. Murder is like one of our fucking favorite pastimes as human beings. Uh, we just sort of, it's easier to do it when it's religion because then it's an us versus them mentality and you're allowed to kill anyone that isn't the same as you. So then it's fine, right? But I don't believe that, because if you're saying that, that religions corrupt or religions lead to war, then you're automatically saying that there must be a God. Like anyone that makes the claim that, oh my God, yes, but religion leads to so many wars and it just makes people hate other people, then you cannot be an atheist and also claim that. Because by claiming that, you're suggesting that a religion has the power to change human beings, thereby the religion is powerful, so it must be a god, right? There must be some sort of metaphysical being that changes these people. It's far more believable to say that the people are just fucking people, and people are scumbags, right? And Drickus, thank you so much for Prime Top, really appreciate that. Three months in a row. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't mind, by the way, anyone can believe I have a lot of respect for religious people, my entire family is very religious. I myself, uh, I believe myself to be agnostic insofar as I do believe there is a God. I just don't believe in any codified religion. But I do think there's a God. I just think God is very misunderstood. Um, I don't think, for example, he gives a shit what you do with your life. Um, but, you know, I don't mind when people believe in things. I find it interesting. Wouldn't the argument from atheists be religion is relation to the participants, not their God or beliefs? The problem with that, though, homeless dude, is how does the religion have the power to do it? Like, something must be special. Like, there must be something special to this thing. It's, for example, so you'll get people that, for example, say... Um, Everything that's wrong with uh, with society right now is a is uh, is the fault of Christianity, and it's sort of like wait, but if Christianity could do that, then it must be real. It's far more likely that humans are just fucked up creatures that do fucked up things to each other, and that the religions that we created also managed to be quite fucked up because, hey, it was humans that created it at the end of the day, right? Um, that's if we take the, the if we take the uh, sort of argument that religions isn't real. They might be. We don't know. Um, but if you were to, I'm sort of making the claim now from the side of an atheist. This is why I can't call myself an atheist. 
For all the amazing achievements of the Emperor, he would be ultimately defeated, not by a supremely powerful alien race or a godlike demon from the warp. Instead, he was defeated by the simple fact that mankind was fundamentally flawed. And how tragic that despite the Emperor having learned so much from his thousands of years observing humanity, this was not enough to prevent it retracing its fatal errors time and time again. Well, that was that. The age of the Imperium is now one of bureaucracy, of tyrants and unreason. An era of slow growth yep. and repression. Humanity has frustratingly regressed back into religious beliefs while the Emperor sits immobile, unable to guide and enact um woodland man i think we should i should probably and i don't want to make this about this right i would like to finish the video but i will say i will finish my thoughts on it this way um old school atheism is fine because yes old school atheism is simply the belief that there is no god although i do question the ability to say with absolute certainty that there is no god because it seems to me that if you are going to believe that there is no god then there is some semblance of belief, almost religious belief, in the absolute uh, absence of a god. Consider the fact that you can't prove that there is no such thing as a god. It seems to me far more prudent to say, I do not know, and therefore I don't believe in anything, but there could be. Uh, I find that to be a much more rational stance than just saying there is no god, because stating that is you kind of need, need evidence right if you're going to come to such a deep conclusion on the matter uh, but new atheists on the other hand do not just believe that there is no god they actively fight to basically destroy all religion um that's the new atheist movement the four horses of the apocalypse uh, four horsemen of the of the atheist movement sam harris uh christopher hitchens those guys they have an active issue with religion. Now, from there, I have a problem because you're setting out on this religious crusade with nigh but your own religious belief that there is no God, which is sort of weird to me. Enact his true will. His thoughts we can only glimpse at and are largely unknown. The immortal super being whose remaining psychic power still extends over a million worlds is now a ruined husk. His mortal body, to all definitions, destroyed. Yeah, this is a horrible the fucking existence, bro. succeeded in preventing total annihilation from the forces of Horus and the Warp and Chaos, the cost of that conflict was unquantifiable. The ultimate loss was not that of life or territory, but the failure to establish the secular and stable empire the Emperor had hoped to create. Yeah, it's now a religious fucking nut hole, like hell hole, actually. Anytime. Rebuke, take care of yourself, brother. Thanks so much the for hanging out, man. was ended. Primarch Gilliman and the Ultramarines had secured the territories of the Imperium of Man, and the remaining Imperial forces had consolidated and restructured for the future and the security of the Empire. The age of the Imperium of Man would now begin at the end of the 31st millennium. The light and hope of the glorious Crusade era was now gone forever. Without the Emperor to lead humanity directly, the immeasurable threats to the galaxy presented to human life led the High Lords of Terror to create an Imperial administration that was increasingly authoritarian, highly bureaucratic and generally dismissive and uncaring towards individual human life. I'm assuming this took a long time. Like, it didn't... Right after all this, the Imperium didn't just immediately turn into the hellscape that it is now, right? Lives, as long as its structure and authority was maintained. Religion also would begin to resurge as an important tool of social control. The Emperor's preferred original rationalist truth was sidelined by the growing imperial cult, believing, as once the word bearers legion had, that the Emperor was a divine being and the saviour of mankind. Only the latter would be an accurate statement. Uh -huh. For many people, this point in time would be the end of our story. But there's more. Despite things seeming more stable now, this would not last. Battle An extreme sisters. and horrific attack would now come barely 500 years after the inception of the High Lords of Terror by the Officio Assassinorum. This was the highly secretive and lethal assassin's wing of the Imperial forces. On the orders of the Grand Master of Assassins, the High Lords were slain to a single man. 
A retribution force of space marines was dispatched to the assassin's temple, and Why? despite suffering near total casualties, they were able to complete their objective and kill the Grand Master of the Assassin's Order. The Imperium would now descend into near anarchy for a period of years while a new High Council was screened and established. But why? Another small aside now on the fates of the remaining Primarch. Uh, he doesn't actually explain why did the uh, assassins kill the um, the Council. Blanket, how you doing, bro? Rin the Weirdo, how you doing, brother? He's a bit of a it's an old one situation. Uh, it doesn't help that the Primarch's gone missing midway. Anyways, praise the Omnisire. Fuck Lorgar. He got what he wanted, though. Political backstabbing. It was a power move. Of course it was a fucking power move. Baron Lightning, how you doing, brother? Thanks for the tier one stuff. Did really appreciate it. Seven months in a row. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind, sir. This is one issue that is hugely frustrating, that despite the survival of many of the Primarchs through the darkest of times, many would now disappear or die, and in the overall perspective of things, often barely befitting their weight and importance. This is one bone of contention I have with the lore, as to me it seems these unique characters were essentially just written out of history as a matter of convenience. It's very frustrating. To satisfy your curiosity though, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists would die in the last 31st millennium fighting to defend against the first Black Crusade. These were crusades launched from the Eye of Terror by the Traitor Legions into the Imperium. Robert Gilliman would be fatally wounded during the Battle of Thessala in 121 millennium 31, when he encountered one of the traitor Primarchs Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children, who had risen to become a demon prince. Wait, he died? Smash. Fulgrim cut Gilliman's neck with a poisonous sword that some say resembled an anatheme sword, which was used to wound Horus on the moon of Davin at the inception of the Horus heresy. Wait, but I thought Gilliman was the one wielding the sword. Oh, he got reanimated, okay. Vulcan of the Salamanders disappeared. He was seemingly disillusioned and broken after his legion's devastating losses during the heresy. He vowed to return in the end times. However, he would appear some 1500 years later where he would defend the Imperial world Caldera against an orc invasion. He would then return to Holy Terror and berate the High Lords of Terror for their petty squabblings. Vulcan would restate his return was only temporary and he was destined to appear in another time. He would later be recorded as killed battling an orc warboss. The Salamanders though still hunt for him, believing he will return to them should they acquire the nine artifacts of Vulcan. Jagatay oh, Khan of the White Scars disappeared through a dark Eldar warp portal whilst he was pursuing those savage Xenos after a raid on the White Scars homeworld. Rumours that he was captured whilst lost in the twisting paths of the Dark Eldar section of the webway. Oh, Lionel wow. Johnson of the Dark Angels returned to his homeworld of Caliban to find it in ruins and some of his marines tainted by chaos. Whilst battling them, the Dark Chaos Gods unleashed a massive warp storm upon the planet, consuming the majority of structures save the Dark Angel's own fortress. But when the storms abated, the lion was nowhere to be found. The Dark Angels hold amongst their number many rumours about where he is and how one day return to them. Okay. Korax of the Raven Guard wanted to repopulate his legion after the Isvan V massacre. He sought to accelerate the growth of his legion by obtaining a sample of the pure Primarch DNA from Terra that the Emperor had used to create his sons. The Emperor psychically implanted the memory of the ancient laboratory in his mind to allow Korax to carry out this mission, and the needed genetic material was obtained. Now though, infiltrators within the Raven Guard from the chaos-tainted Alpha Legion used a demonic essence to corrupt this pure Primarch DNA sample, Fuck. causing many newly created Raven Guard to become distorted, abhorrent mutants. Korax would become so ashamed, guilt-stricken, and disillusioned with himself that he isolated himself away for a whole year, begging the Emperor's spirit for forgiveness, before he would ultimately fly alone straight into the Eye of Terror to wreak revenge on the traitors. Lehman oh, Ross of the Space Wolves is one of the Primarchs whose disappearance appears to be voluntary. The Space Wolves hold a legend that says Russ went on a quest to find a means to cure the Emperor with the fruit from the mystical Tree of Life. 
but the truth is likely to be far more complex. Others have said that Ross travelled into the Eye of Terror to lead his lost 13th company against Magnus the Red and the Thousand Sons Traitor Legion. Still, other legends hold that Ross was dying and that he shall return to when the Imperium most needs him, the period called the Wolf Time, to lead the Wolves of Fenris once more. Okay. With the Primarchs gone, the Chapter Masters would take command and the High Lords of Terror would truly become now the rulers of the Imperium. Thankfully though, this poor and horrific start to the Imperium would now be replaced by three millennia of strength and stability from the period of M32 to M35. The Imperium was able to re-establish roots with most of its major colonies, as well as securing and bringing into the Imperium many new colonies not reached during the Crusades, who proved to be immeasurably valuable. As an added bonus, Imperial forces were able to secure an incredibly rare and well-preserved STC from the Dark Age of Technology, which uh -huh. further boosted the development of new technology. Oh, so we have a couple of HDCs. The Mechanicum of Mars that the Imperium was still a worthwhile ally and deserving of their continued partnership without even the Emperor. Despite the carnage and appalling threats occurring in the universe, a great many worlds within the Imperium see none of this in their lifetime, and some worlds have the good fortune to actually live in relative peace. In fact, many Imperial systems actually have very little interaction with the structure or forces of the Imperium. To many citizens, the prospect of actually seeing a fabled space marine of the Imperium, these semi-godlike figures, is a lifelong dream and one that very few people actually get to experience. The space marines- Why would you want to see a space marine? Someone told me the other day, when you see a space marine, you know shit's fucked up. You do not see a space marine unless the situation is very dire. So that's when you know shit. All right, th this is this is a fucking problem. Are not posted to all planets. There are simply just too few of them now for this to be feasible. Instead, they maintain a presence on the most threatened or precarious of systems, defending the Imperium against the worst Xenos concentrations or assisting the Inquisition to seek out and destroy any signs of corruption. They also continue the search for the STCs, the Holy Grails of the Imperium, relics of immeasurable value. The safety of the Imperium is maintained through fact-finding missions and reports from psychers across light yeah, and okay. space. Yeah, okay. Alright, if if you're gonna have a choice, who do you rather want to see? Do you want to see a space marine or a grey knight? The, what would you choose, chat? If you were to have that choice. Let's, uh, let's quickly do a, a nice poll here, shall we? All right. Let's see. Let's see the results of this. Who would you guys rather see? A Grey Knight or a Space Marine? The Adeptus Administratum maintain a highest level of information possible so that all Imperial... Let me set the stage very quickly here. Let me just set the stage. You're living your life, right? You, you guys are doing your thing. You're having, you're having fun. You're hanging out. And uh, your planet comes under attack. There's an attack. You guys are fighting. And someone shows up. Is the person showing up a space marine or a grey knight? In which instance are you more or less fucked? Imperial forces can focus their diminished resources on the most likely locations at risk. Frustratingly though, and almost unbelievably, the Imperium would now sanction religion as many imperial cults had risen, dedicating to the worship of the- Homeless dude, I just want to say, according to Lutonier himself, um, there are places in the Imperium that is relatively peaceful. Where the people have never seen a space marine, they have never seen war, they, they don't know any of the things that's going on. So even in the 41st century, there does appear to be homeworlds, at least to some extent, where, like, horrible shit don't all the time fucking happen. The Emperor as the god of mankind. The majority of these would become unified. I think so. 
Uh, yes, Ethan, I do think I have seen it. Thanks for the 100 bits. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, Dark Tide is the vermin tide of the 40k universe, right? Because I'm pretty sure we watched that. This religious body known as the Ecclesiarchy. This powerful church gained momentum until the 32nd millennium where it became the official state religion of the Imperium and the title of Adeptus Ministorum. Centuries later, Ecclesiarch Venerus II receives a seat amongst the High Lords of Terror, and after 300 standard years, the seat reserved for the Ecclesiarch is made a permanent addition to the ranks of the High Lords of Terror. Given that the Lords are meant to in Fuck. That's where I want to live in the 41st century, is on one of these... Uh paradise worlds, you know, where everything is just fucking beautiful and hunky-dory. That's where I want to live. Infer the Emperor's psychic whispers and wishes, these actions make you question how little they're actually able to communicate with the Emperor, or perhaps how much they choose to ignore given the fact that the Emperor flew into a near rage when he discovered the actions of the word bearers during the Great Crusade. Uh -huh. Should the Emperor ever return to the Imperium reincarnated, which is entirely feasible, those pledged to any Imperial religion or who took a hand in its establishment would be wise to expect a harsh judgement from the Emperor, who despised all forms of religion and saw them as nothing but a problem for the advancement of humanity. The Imperium of Did if the Emperor ever returned, considering all the shit that has happened here? Uh, I think he'd just leave humanity well enough alone. Considering the fact that as soon as he fucking did, um, humanity went right back to their religious virtues and basically fucked everything that he once was. Although, I should say, as long as the Empress sits on the Golden Throne, there's no way for him to return, from what I understand at least of man would stand until its current date of the 41st millennium and despite it or maybe maybe i'll just throw this out there as a possible theory then take this with a grain of salt because as far as theories go i'm in no position to make them maybe that's why the emperor asked that dude i can't remember the dude's name to put him on the throne because the emperor knew that if he died out, like if he died off the throne, it would be 25,000 years before he'd be able to return, if not longer. Because apparently it does take a long time for a soul to be reborn. Not Malkador. Malkador is the one sitting on the throne. Uh, while the emperor was lying there, one of the Primarchs came to the emperor and the emperor whispered to him as a final act to take him to the golden throne. When they arrived there, Malkador was already basically getting fucked. And as soon as they removed him, uh, was that Rogel Dawn? Dawn, that's the one. Yes, yes, yes. Rogel Dawn. So when the emperor spoke to Rogel Dawn, I like that, but also at the same time, I sort of don't. I think the, the religious aspect is just man-made, right? That's just a human thing. But here's my theory that I think, at least. The Emperor, in telling Rogel Dawn, listen here, take me to uh, the Golden Throne. Because the Emperor is described as being a dead god, merely kept alive by the souls of psychers. Right? It is the souls of the psychers that is keeping the Emperor's body alive. So what if the Golden Throne provides the Emperor with the ability for his soul, whilst now in the warp, to still be connected to humanity? So thereby giving the Emperor the ability to communicate with humanity while the Emperor waits for himself to be reincarnated. So for him to be reborn, however much time that takes, he at least doesn't have to leave humanity, if that makes sense. Um, so it could be that the emperor could be reborn even without leaving the throne. So still on the golden throne, but the emperor could absolutely come back. 
its often counterproductive bureaucracy, it continues to function and maintain a strong fighting force within the galaxy. Member worlds generally govern themselves as long as they recognise the authority of the Emperor and his appropriate civil servants and support the state religion, the Imperial cult. Which places the Raph, yeah, we've, see, the we've seen that. being the true god of mankind. Every world of the Imperium pays also the Imperial taxes levied on them, but not in monetary form, they pay in men and materials, known as the Imperial Tithe. The Imperial Tithe supports the overall... Holy shit. Huh. That's interesting. So maybe the Emperor have already been born again. ...the economy of the Imperium by redistributing resources where needed, supporting one region by drawing resources from more peaceful sectors. The Imperium promotes the development of a neo-feudal political system, which the High Lords of... Dude, when I watch Warhammer stuff, my mind is all over the fucking place. Like, my mind goes nuts with theories and shit that's happening. It is such a fucked up world, but so good. In, like, in such a good way. Such a fucked up world. It is insane. And also, it seems like 43 of you would prefer seeing a space marine, whereas only 7 of you would want to see a Grey Knight. Thanks for the 200 bits, dude. Really appreciate that. I can see that. Snubby, how you doing, brother? I can absolutely see that. For an emperor that does have the ability to see the future, I understand that. Why no one wants to see a Grey Knight? Uh, Raskar, I already know the, the answer to that question. The Grey Knights are basically, like... When you see them, there is a very good chance that, well, y you will die, right? Because first and foremost, aren't they the guys that's basically their entire existence is secret? So if you saw a Grey Knight, the Grey Knight would kill you just so that you didn't know or would be able to tell anyone that you saw a Grey Knight. And then also the case of uh, exterminatus and shit that can happen. It's basically, I would shit my pants if I saw the Inquisitors as well. I'd just shit myself because I'd be like, fuck. There's probably a giant light coming. We're about to get fucking slaughtered here. The Terror and the Inquisition have decided to be the most stable form of human government. This essentially means that a ruling class or powerful family oversee the needs of the planet. This intense need for political stability and the growing military demands upon the Imperial system have created a repressive state, and the belief in the Divine Emperor has only reduced scientific progress to a minimum. Ancient technology from the Unification Wars and Crusades, or even the Dark Age of... By the way, Morris, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Daniels, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. I think if you see anything in the Warhammer universe, you're fucked. <laughs> this is kind of true, right? It's, this is kind of true. The technology are merely maintained and are rarely pushed forward. This stagnation has led to many to describe this period leading on from the dawn of the 40th millennium as the time of ending for mankind. Mm -hmm. It must be said though, that with the admittedly often repressive and regularly harsh regime of the Imperium, the protection it provides, mankind as a whole would have been consumed by the seemingly endless dangers that threaten it. Without the Emperor, there would be no Imperium of Man, and without the Imperium and mankind's faith in the Emperor, the human race would have surely become extinct long ago. Still, despite all of this, you could in many ways argue that even with all the flaws and failings, the Emperor had achieved most of the goals he had set in order to make mankind a stable and powerful force within the galaxy. Or did he? No. At first glance, the forging of the Imperium of Man and the Imperial Truth during the Great Crusade seems to be a great contradiction. If the Emperor, who had lived for many thousands of years, and who, due to his own extreme psychic power, knew intimately the realm of the Warp and the creatures therein, why would he propagate a system designed to only support rationalism and science? 
it seems feasible to speculate that the Emperor had plans that reached far beyond the Crusades and the creation of the Imperium, and that these had barely even begun to pass. In that sense, the Imperium and the Legionis Astartes was a catastrophic failure. We can speculate that the Emperor's overall goal was the total destruction of the Chaos Gods and those dark forces that would threaten yeah. mankind. The Emperor had fair reason to turn humanity to a secular society, having witnessed many times over I would, the will of men. I would agree actually with Swanky Tiger here. If you wanted to starve and ultimately kill the Chaos Gods, here's what you would have to do, right? So, first, create a society that is purely based on rationalism and get emotions under control, right? Second, slaughter all other alien races. This includes the Eldar, the Catan, the Old Ones, the Orcs, uh, the... Um, Emo boys or the wee boys, whatever the fuck they're called. I can't remember now. The Tau, I think they're referred to. Um, so you slaughter all of them. And this should technically weaken the Chaos Gods to the point of obscurity, in essence. Although, would that not just feed and create some kind of new Chaos God? Because all these rational rational thoughts and stuff would now obviously still flow into the warp, which would then just create something new, right? No, you don't have to apologize, dude. Thanks for the 200 bits. Really appreciate that. Uh, Lord of Death, how you doing, brother? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. There was actually a god of atheism? Was there? Hmm. So Gilliman discussed that with some Aldor. Dude, I, I'm definitely going to have to read the books. Man, man, how you doing, brother? Thanks for the first time chat. Really appreciate that. Can I be either way with all the war? Yeah, but once the war is over, Corn would be fucked because Corn would receive no more war. Because the Imperium would control everything, right? Transforming a faith based on the tenets of loving your fellow man and respect for one another into bloody creeds of appalling violence, repression, murder, and wholesale genocide. These actions, as with the Eldar, would actually strengthen the Chaos Gods. So the Emperor perceived that religion and faith was something that had no benefit in his current aspirations. In a sense, he was correct when you look at the facts on paper and also when you consider the Word Bearers Legion and how it would take them significantly longer than any other Astartes Legion when converting the worlds they found to the divine cult of the Emperor. The Emperor had decided that during the Age of Strife, it was time for him to come to the fore and take control of the situation. He feared that unless all of mankind was united, it would eventually be consumed by the nightmares facing the galaxy, including mm -hmm. Chaos and other Xenos races. By enforcing the Imperial Truth on every colony of humanity in the galaxy, the Emperor had hoped to forge a belief in rational thinking and science so strong that the warp creatures of Chaos who lived off the dark energy and negative emotions of humanity would become permanently weakened to the point that they might even dissolve from the warp. The only problem with this plan would be that the dark forces were far from weak when the Emperor brought his plan to its inception. They were at the height of their power feasting off the perverse fall of the Eldar Empire. Yes. So from the beginning, Chaos sought to destroy his plans, or at the very least significantly disrupt them. Ultimately, as it would play out, they would be successful to this end. When looking yeah, at this Chaos did whole, win, it would be effectively. conclusion to say that the Emperor deeply underestimated humanity's basic need for at least a proportion of society to believe in something larger than itself, beyond the sterile confines of science and technology. In many ways, the grim comedy of the whole affair is that the Emperor rigidly maintained that he should never be worshipped as a divine being, but as just a man, albeit an unbelievably powerful man. His questionable judgement in laying the foundations of the Imperium and later the Crusades proved his own proclamations that he was indeed just a man, capable of miscalculations as any mortal human. Yet despite this, he Yeah, but I would have argued it would have been better maybe for the Emperor to let people believe him a god. In, in, 
I will. I think so, at least. Spartan, take care of yourself, brother. Thanks so much for hanging out. Really appreciate that. There is actually a zone in space called the Pariah Sector, which is completely cut off from the warp. Here is the twist. Nothing living can actually survive there. We need the warp, warp to exist. Wait, why can nothing living survive there? Still would end up becoming worshipped as a divine being. You could call the whole series of events a tragedy, especially in the sense that legions of religious worshippers and pilgrims of the Imperium could never understand the irony of worshipping a man who had, over the course of millennia, done everything in his power to extinguish religion from the human race. Mm -hmm. To rub salt into the wound though, it is especially contentious that the binding factor in holding the Imperium together after the heresy was in part of course the Ultramarines but also, significantly, religious faith in the Emperor himself. Added to this though, humanity's religious faith in the godlike Emperor would actually empower his psychic form in the warp and enable him to combat chaos on their own plane as well as continuing to guide and protect humanity in the material world through the Astronomicon and his ever guiding light. Which all seems ultimately ironic that for all of the Emperor's efforts to destroy organized religion it would ultimately become his saving grace. Though the price for the survival of the Imperium and humanity had been at a level beyond comprehension and a cost far greater than the Emperor hoped humanity would have had to bear, a new version of the Imperial Truth had Interesting. So, yeah, we, well, we need the warp, but that doesn't mean we need the chaos gods. Because from, it is my understanding again, and I always say it's my understanding because I get bits and pieces of lore from things that I read and things that I sort of hear from you guys. The chaos gods weren't always there. Like, the warp originally was just sort of the coalescence of all energy. The Chaos Gods were created. Necron fuckery. Our souls are part of the warp. We are naturally connected. That's why he wanted to move humanity into the webway to isolate us from the warp, as trying to forcefully severing the connection is bad. Right, that makes sense. And yeah, the pylons we saw in the Gothica 2 trailer, or like end cutscene thing. Uh, we saw the pylon stuff. ...had become predominant among the million worlds of mankind. A truth that lies at the heart of the Imperial Creed. A simple truth that strengthens all from the weakest human citizen to the most powerful superhuman Astartes. The Emperor protects.